So thank you, Mike Stahl, uh, Sergeant First Class, United States Army Special Forces, Mac V. Sog. Uh, we're really honored to have you here with us today. We're excited to talk to you about um, your tours in Vietnam and about uh, about everything about your story that you want to you want to go through. Um, we were just talking about some of the stuff you got on the wall behind you, uh, but Rob and I had watched uh, that Heritage Arsenal. They put together like a little exhibit uh, yes. out of some of your memorabilia. All of and my memorabilia. Yeah, I donated everything I had dealing with the Army to them. Uh, so, uh, so they put some of the good stuff up on the wall. They built those displays uh, for my stuff. I don't know how much they spent, but, it, you know, uh, I'm greatly honored, but you know, the thing is, uh, the unit I was in, Mac V. Saad, there's a lot of history there. And, uh, uh, I knew, you know, with my situation, when, when I die, all my stuff was going to end up in a dumpster someplace because I don't have anybody that it would be meaningful to. So, uh, sure. uh, through a, uh, retired master sergeant, I knew, uh, got me in touch with, uh, Colonel Lynn and man, it's just worked out perfectly because, uh, you know, it, it's like I feel like a little pharaoh. pharaoh. My pyramid's going to be there for a long time. Uh, I think it was, it goes back to Plato, who first noted that as long as somebody remembers us, a piece of us is still alive, and we all want to live forever. So, but but the big thing is, it's it's a good display for anybody that uh, wants to see some of the stuff relevant to special forces in Vietnam. And our history has been lost. Let's face it. You know, we. We we were doing our thing during a decade in this country of turmoil. You know the race relations, the the riots, the peace riots, the assassinations. So, like we do as a an individual, as a nation, we've just blocked that part of memory. You know that whole decade, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of good men and the good men of SOG uh, get lost in that history. We don't we don't learn about them like we did uh, Merrill's Marauders or the uh, the Rangers at Navarone. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. and it's unfortunate that people don't understand the sacrifices that were made. And it's probably becoming important for people of, you know, my generation to be able to, to kind of uncover some of that history and to be yeah. able to yeah. preserve that. And that's becoming more apparent to me as I dive more and more into this is how valuable that is, especially, you know, we look at World War II vets and, you know, there there's very few of them left now. And it's like yeah. right now it's so important to capture that uh, from from all of you amazing gentlemen who who were part of this. Um, so why do you think it's so specifically for SOG? Why do you think it's so important for people to know about what happened there and the history behind it? I think the big thing is, the bottom line is, uh, you know, we, we talk about today, you know, that, that when you're in combat, if you're in Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, our, our latest wars, uh, you're there for your buddy, you know, you're, you're covering his back. You're not, you're no longer there for any other reason than, you know, complete the mission. Uh, I think, and SOG isn't the only thing. We go back to the OSS. We go back, we go back to the Revolutionary War. We go back a long way and it shows uh, the lengths men will do, not, I have to be non-sexist today, that the lengths men and women, people will do, uh, for the mission to protect other people. Uh, I look back at, at uh, working to get into SOG, to run recon, you know, that, that it's where I felt I could do the most good for the war effort. Uh, none of us, I mean, I knew guys in special forces that were there to win, win medals. I mean, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to, to get that rack. It's good for promotions, blah, blah, blah. But 99.9% of us were there because we felt we could make a difference in the war by saving American and allied lives, by saving our brothers. Uh, it got to the point, we're talking about intel. Uh, many people know about the Enigma machine, machine back in World War II, that we were getting so much intel, we had to let some 
ship sink, right? We we got in a situation in SOG where some guy would come back, say, I, I'm, I'm debriefing him. I'm filling out an immediate intelligence summary that we've got masses of NVA troops right across the border about to attack an American division, but we don't have any way to tell them because we're not supposed to know we know that. Yeah. So we actually had to figure out back channels to let regular units know if they were in trouble. So, so uh, the compartmentalization, but the bottom line is we even b- broke our own regulations because we were not there just to collect data. We were there to save lives. And we weren't going to wait for somebody to process that data. Uh, and we know with bin Laden, there was cases to get him where the, the, the OK had to come from, from Langley. And by the mm-hmm. time the OK got to them, we lost, you know. So bottom line is, is uh, there's a lot of good people that will put everything on the line for the mission. Sure. And, Amen. And people Absolutely. need to understand that. It's not only the, the, the guys that were in the unit, it's the families. I mean, you know, uh, it's like with PTSD. The veteran doesn't have PTSD. His family has PTSD. The impacts of lo- losing a loved one, nobody really thinks about the families, and especially when these guys are doing top secret missions, and, and it's it's all deniable, and we can't tell you what they were doing. Uh, that's bad enough, but for some populations, uh, uh, basically, it really impacted her brother's life. I mean, so so these types of things, somebody needs to know about it. This history needs to be preserved because it's not just the war; it's everything that happens after the war. And, yeah. and they have a tendency to sweep that under the rug sometimes. Sure. And that's, yeah. we had just talked with Jim Moriarty, who was a, uh, who was a, a door gunner uh, with uh, the Marine Corps in Vietnam. And he was talking about that same thing. He lost his son uh, who was in special forces. In uh-huh. And uh, he was talking about how much it can mean, you know, to have those stories preserved for people who, you loved, you know, maybe didn't make it through yes. uh, and yeah. how much, you know, that connection to them can mean. And that, that was so powerful. So yeah, absolutely. Well, and that, that is the cool. other side of it. It isn't, I mean, I've got, I've got a, a personal interest in this whole thing. I want to share my stories like, it, you know, uh, we're all kind of storytellers. When something happens to us, we want to share it. We can't wait to get home and tell mom when something good happened at school. We're just big kids. I got to do some really neat things. Uh, I like to tell people that uh, Operation Dumbo Drop was a real special forces operation. And I was right there and watched it happen. And uh, uh, I went to dinner at the White House. I mean, those are exciting things we want to share with people. Uh, Yeah. And and, uh, uh, and a lot of this stuff, of course, with special forces, we couldn't share it technically. You know, uh, most of us broke the rules a little bit. And the other side of it then, too, with boy, we got a lot of sides here. Uh, the other side of it with, with <laughs> Vietnam veterans is that talking about taboo was was a taboo. A ta- talking about Vietnam was a taboo topic. I mean, I. I, I was really close. I, I was raised with nieces and nephews that were my peer group, not my brothers and sisters. So I had a, a nephew a year younger than I uh, served in Vietnam, I think, with the first cab as a grunt, came back, became a chopper pilot, went over and earned a uh, distinguished flying cross, rescuing some Marines off one of the hills. He was flying an old CH-47. We all were back in, in Bradenton, Florida together, uh, partying together, getting high together, doing everything together. We never talked about Vietnam. I mean, it was that's how taboo the topic was. Uh, so now that it is getting more appropriate, now that the SEALs have come out, and I'm sorry, you know, stop being the quiet professional, because that was ingrained into us too. 
You know, you don't Definitely. talk about what you do. You didn't, you don't pat yourself on the back. You do your thing and you go home. Uh, all of that busted loose, obviously, with Iraq and Afghanistan. Part of it good, but with anything else, things can be. You know, but now I, I really have this urge. I have nothing better to do. And I, and I want to get these messages out to people. So there's there's a lot of layers to all of this. There are, yeah. I mean, Mike, we, we have, um, when we did the interview with General Ken Bore, uh, that was the first time he's given an interview. And, you know, he's in his 70s. And his whole yes. life, he's never been on camera. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> you know, you guys, you guys live in the shadows, right? And that's, that, and that's right, right for your profession. So, uh, you know, but I, I, I really take your point about um, coming back from Vietnam and the taboo. And when we designed, when we came up with the idea for the game, it was about, a big part of it was about representing indigenous troops. Oh my gosh, yes. Because they, they're just kind of forgotten in history, you know, like a side note. And those guys were the hardcore of SOG, you know. Um, and, uh, and the other aspect really was just to try and change a little bit the, 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 the perception of the war. It's not just about rock and roll in helicopters and blowing up villages, that it's actually, these are intelligent, you know, tactical battles that were going on and, and real brave acts that, you know, and, and a lot of that stuff got swept under the rug because of all the, the political uh, concerns about the war uh, in the, you know, the, the revisionist changing the history of things. Yes. And you guys could never speak out for yourselves because you were forbidden. So, you know, so, so that was, that was what inspired us to make, make the game um, and to, and to focus it on, on SOG. Well, well, Another problem with this I found is uh, uh, a few years uh, back, I got involved with the PTSD TBI group that was mostly younger vets. Uh, there were a couple of us, us Vietnam vets there. Uh, and I was glad to be there because I've had a rough time with PTSD. I've had multiple suicide attempts. So one thing I'm not good at is killing myself for some reason. But I could sit there and, and, and tell these young vets were, which were going through problems, look at you can survive, you know, and, and kind of help them along. But the big thing I've noticed with the younger vets is uh, start to start with, you know, when, when they would ask me about the homecoming and I would tell me my you know, experiences, they said, oh, that really happened. It, it's like they've heard kind of the stories but they don't understand the depth and breadth of the issue, right? Uh, and, and of course, the other thing is where I revere the, the uh, World War II vets, I mean, you know, World War II vets that I had uh, in my experiences, my, one of, uh, or my first sergeant in infantry AIT was one of Merrill's marauders. I mean, and, and when I met these guys, they were gods to me. Uh, the younger vets looking back at Vietnam, because I think of the whole history thing, they don't really respect us. Uh, I'm right here, uh, right outside of Cannon Air Force Base, the 27th Special Operations Group for the Air Force. All the 130s are out here, uh, which is, you know, it's and I went down to the VFW, joined down there. These guys aren't interested in talking to me. You know, and, and I kind of bring out, hey, I was in the first de facto JSOC. I mean, we were a Joint Special Operations Command. That's where JSOC comes from today. Mm -hmm. And it's, oh, really? <laughs> you know, and, and it kind of hurts me. I stopped going down there because I'd go down there. I'd buy myself a couple of beers. Somebody might buy me a beer. Uh, but it was like, man, I've got all this, this military stuff I want to talk about. And these guys just don't seem to be interested. And uh, I think that's unfortunate. So I really, uh, I really respect and applaud the things that you guys do to maybe sometime 100 years from now, somebody will look at this and you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think for SOG guys, um, people probably think you're fake because, because a lot of what you say and do, uh, say you did, they can't believe it. It's just absolutely inconceivable. It could be real. Uh, I've read circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've both read a lot of memoirs and we've interviewed a lot of SOG veterans. So we know that this stuff is, 
you know, is wilder than the, you know, the truth is wilder than fantasy. I, uh, but, got, but, it, but, but you must, you must get that. You must get guys challenging you. And, and I, I've got, I've got to interject when I, I got here, uh, I'm still dealing with some PTSD issues. So the only option here was the VA, which I would rather die than go back to the VA, but I needed help. Thought I'd give them a chance. They have these young female social workers, I'm sorry, who have, have can't even sit through a war movie. And, and so I got into the group. Everybody there had been in Laos one way or another. This one guy was in Vietnam so early, there are no records of him. Uh, he was on a mission to, to capture a Russian general. I mean, his stories, and it's true. I mean... I'm sitting there and, and I'm really the guy that was in Laos and everybody thinks I'm the wannabe. And I'm the guy that's got the photographs and the documents. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. I have run into this so much. As soon as you just, you know, if I say, well, I was in the 101st, okay, they'll talk about you. Well, I was in this ultra top secret unit, CCN and SOG. Oh, yeah. I'll, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And and, and uh, I was just talking to Colonel Lynn about this, the uh, the gentleman that runs the uh, Heritage Arsenal, and, and uh, he was talking about running into wannabes. Uh, uh, so it, and and I don't know, you guys, even back in in the early days in the eighties, we had wannabes with NSF. We had a guy going around claiming to be one of the Sante Raiders. Chapters were flying him in. He was giving speeches and stuff. And then he got nailed one time at the convention. Uh, he was bragging right next to a bunch of Sante Raiders. So, but it's yeah. it's like Colonel Lynn, what we were talking about. When they talk about stolen valor, I can take that personal. Hmm. You know, we, we, we uh, yeah, so that's, it's aggravating. Well, I think one of the things we want to do is to continue telling individual people's stories. And, and what we did in the game was we've actually got Jim Shaw 10, Tilt, Ken, Don Hassey, an aviator, you know, and we've actually created their characters and put them in the game and we talk about them. And, and they actually, you know, they actually proofread the script so that when we, when you play the game, you actually have kind of their opinion on things coming through in the narrative. And then we also we also had about 30 SOG veterans give us quotes of what would you say to someone who's just landed at CCN or CCS or CCT? Yeah. And what question would you ask him? You know, what would you tell him uh, to, to survive? You know, and we had all these bits of quite salty feedback from everyone, you know, <laughs> things they yeah. would say. And so we stuck all that in the game as well, you know, and it's, it's trying to preserve some of the character of you guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see how this is all integrated. Don't need to spend a lot of time on it now, but I'm yeah. really fascinated to uh, to see the, how this is all done because, uh, <clears throat> you know, well, I, I see I'm, this as a, the potential of an excellent teaching tool uh, for teaching history. That, that was what I was going to ask you, Mike, was what would you expect to find in a SOG game? You know, what would make it a SOG game for you? Yeah. Uh, I'm not a gamer. You know, what I've seen is movies with gamers or this sort of thing with the modern games. I mean, I go back to the first Atari Space Invaders, stuff, stuff like that. Uh, the first actual computer game I was, you move this little guy around on a screen and, he, you know, it was like a... a, a where am I? My, my brain uh, uh, going out and finding stuff and you finally get to and you have to save the princess. Uh, I started writing a sod game in basic. And uh, my thing was, you know, I, I built uh, a target area, kind of a topo map of a target area. Uh, I had various missions, you know, POW smash, snatch or whatever. Uh, and then uh, the player, of course, this is going way back before graphics. Uh, the player had to pick pick what they were to carry. They had to have so much of a weight limit. Uh, they picked where they wanted to insert, and then their option was to move in one of eight directions, and then using a random number generator, a probability of attack was, and if you know if they followed a trail, they were more you know setting up that way. Uh, but there could be no action the way you guys can. So you know, since our whole goal was to not get into trouble. 
It's hard to me to make, to make it a shoot 'em up game. I can see that in a urban situation, right, where you're where you're having fighting and you don't know where the enemy is. Uh, for my situation, I never saw a living BC, or, or you know, I never used a site. It was all spray and pray. So, so from my perspective, I don't see how that can be made into a game. That, it, but that's my perspective very limited over the whole scope of things. Well, thank you. It's fascinating to hear what your take is on that. And I actually think that's exactly what we designed. So I'll be really interested to show it to you on Sunday. And you can, I'm excited about that. Yeah, yeah. you can check it out for yourself with, with Ken and Dom playing with us. Because um, that whole idea of creating a shooter where you don't shoot... Um, that was that was the difficulty for us in the design was how do you design do something? Trouble. <laughs> yeah, if you do shoot, you're in deep doo doo. <laughs> hey, well, yeah, that's that's what I mean. Once you pull the trigger, you're just running, you know, or you're ducking. There's there, there's nothing what I you know watching action movies that they and, and obviously you, you have to have in, in fiction. Uh, you know what? We'll never have a space movie where space vehicles. Don't fly in air. I mean, you just can't have the sounds. You can't have those sweeping curves. And in combat movies, there always has to be the fights. Spy movies always have to have the gunfights where anybody that knows anything about that sort of things knows that a spy that pulls his gun, everything's going wrong and it doesn't happen very often. You know, it's, it's like it's like Dumbo Drop, Operation Bahroom would have been the sh shortest, most boring movie you could have ever made. So Disney had to have fun with it. So, you know, you, you, fantasy reality, where do you cross the line? Yeah, you'll see where we've made compromises on that because we yeah. had to spice things up sometimes. So, I mean, that happens. Um, coming back to your service, Mike, so sure. can, can you give us a short overview of your four years in the Army before you became a Green Beret? Oh, wow. I mean, th th this goes back to uh, uh, have to look at the Cuban Missile Crisis growing up in Florida, uh, growing up in a generation, new television, everything on TV was patriotic, all the movies. Uh, so uh, I had a brother that was in the 187th Airborne uh, Regimental Combat Team in Korea, 11 years my senior, came home in the khakis, had this tattoo, which got me in trouble in jump school, an airborne tattoo, Cuban Missile Crisis. I had dropped out of high school already, uh, 17. I went down and checked on enlistment to fight the Russians in Cuba. I was down there in uh just south of uh, McDill Air Force Base, which was a SAC base at that time. So if they had fired a missile, uh, I look back now and maybe enlisting was my way to get the hell out of Florida. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I enlisted Airborne Infantry at the end of November of that year, 62, a month after Cuban Missile Crisis. A recruiter had met his quota, so he didn't tell me about all the enlistment options I could have had. Uh, my mom immediately didn't think twice about signing the paper to me for me. I had a, my oldest brother had been Merchant Marine World War II, and then uh, uh, that closer brother had fought Korea. So that was just, the, you know, it's what you did when the country was potentially in trouble. By the time I got to basic, the, uh, the war was over, the war. I mean, that threat was over. Uh, I was in an all airborne basic training company, but I was a, a band nerd. I, I mean, I probably could have gotten in the Army band if I had tried. Uh, I think I weighed about 110 pounds when I enlisted, and I, I couldn't run a quarter mile. I swear, I, JFK's uh, physical health thing, I, I was, uh, but at the end of basic, uh, I uh, was in better shape, but I couldn't pass the airborne physical, so I went to infantry IT. Then I went to jump school, and all of this is important because all of that, not going to jump school right away, put me ending up jump school when they needed parachute riggers. So, uh, so then I volunteered for rigger school, went up to Fort Lee for three months of a great training, you know, I enjoyed the hell out of it, got to jump a lot, a lot more than if I'd gone, you know, regular airborne. And in and, and that timing, 
put me into an assignment at a very, one of the most cherry places for a rigger to be was at the Defense General Supply Center, Richmond, Virginia, which was a small detachment of riggers, um, old NCOs. I had I worked for Master, uh, Master Sergeant Huber, who came in later, who had been a rift major from World War II, uh, was a Master Sergeant E-7, Sergeant Glenn, our NCOIC, was a Master Sergeant E-7, who was an early uh, test jumper <laughs> for the Army. Uh, he had made four airborne jumps with the 82nd in, uh, in uh, Europe. And I had an NCO job, so we weren't treated as privates, had to get an apartment off base. There was no KP. And it was like a civilian job, wow. eight to five, uh, five days a week. Uh, made E4 right away because it was an E6 slot. Uh, made E5 right after I re-enlisted, wandered an assignment in Germany. There wasn't a slot for me, so I asked for German language school. Uh, got my orders. I'd asked for German, French, or Italian. I had, I had three languages. Got my orders to Arabic. Uh, that was uh, the end of 1965. And I swear, guys, I wasn't sure where they spoke Arabic at that time. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? It, it, and... Uh, so I went to Arabic language school, which got me, uh, had me a chance to get into the Fort Orcs Sport Parachute Club very, uh, very actively. And uh, that's where I got re recruited in SF. There was a, a, a guy in, in the club that was TDY from the first special forces and we buddied up. He really liked me. And then McPherson joined, Mac McPherson, who was a TDY from the seventh. He was the recruiter. And they kept pressuring me to apply for uh, special forces, but I didn't want to because I had uh, all that mental image of the bear pit. And frankly, Rambo hadn't come out yet, but that was the whole mythology. Uh, but part of what helped sway me was Barry Sadler. That's when the Green Beret came out and hit hit the, uh, you know, the top 10 stuff on, on AM radio. And uh, they started telling me the real stuff about special forces. And uh, my first thing was Matt kept saying, just take the test. Just take the test. We'll take it. You know, so it was like uh, uh, he was a pusher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was getting me on that soft stuff. And uh, I, I, uh, I think about Mac every day and I thank him because it was the greatest experience of my life. Uh, he wanted me to to try to get, be a medic. He talked me into it, and I'd get home and say, you know, he'd get me all enthused about being a medic, and I'd get home and start thinking about blood and guts, and doesn't bother me, but I didn't want to be a medic. As it turned out, when I got there, I had no choice. They told me I was going to be in their junior uh, 11F program. <laughs> so that's everything before before uh, Vietnam. The biggest thing in my life before then was was – uh, being with uh, Sergeant Glenn, who became my mentor at depot, he was the skydiver. Uh, he had license D8, for anybody who knows skydiving, that's the eighth expert license ever issued in, this, in the country, okay? Uh, and uh, so I met all of the, you know, all of the early jumpers. Uh, I was there when it went from uh, using all surplus equipment to when it got popular enough that... Uh, uh, a pioneer and Switlick were making real equipment just for sport jumping. So it was really the birth of what we call it the space age sport. So that was a very exciting time. And the army was very involved in that. I got to jump with the golden Knights at Fort Bragg, you know, so I, I had a lot oh, of cool, cool experiences there too. Uh, neatest thing there was uh, meeting Eugene Hassenfuss, the guy that started Reagan's war, brought that out of the closet back uh, with the, uh, uh, guns for hostages. Uh, he was my kicker in Vietnam, and he was a skydiver. And uh, we made three jumps together over eight teams, <laughs> one from fifteen thousand four hundred feet out of an Air America Caribou. So I mean, uh, all all for me, skydiving, uh, special forces. I worked with Halo equipment when it was so primitive. <laughs> <laughs> you anybody that knows parachute equipment would laugh at the early halo equipment. So yeah. all of that rolling in together, uh, I had 
you're not supposed to modify an absolute like unique, but I had an extremely unique military career. I guess listening to what you said, Mike, that you had already overcome a lot of fear before you signed up for special forces because anyone that can jump out of a perfectly good airplane, right? Um, yeah. I have I have to correct you. Uh, I've never really known fear except when it comes to asking a girl to dance. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, as a kid, uh, we had Australian pines in Florida. And, and I loved climbing to the highest pine tree I could find in the neighborhood, to the smallest branch, and sitting up there with the trees swinging back and forth. I mean, and and that's just one. Ex I'll give you another one. <laughs> Uh, the, the high school I went to was right across the street from the junior high school. And it, it was built back in the days, uh, really an old school, had a big bo stack boiler, but new buildings had been built around the boiler, the stack. Uh, I have to say it was old south, very integrated. I was from the north, so I had to prove how rebel I was. And <laughs> this would not be politically correct today. And if this gets out, I'll probably be canceled. But, but nonetheless, my buddy and I uh, decided that we were going to put Confederate flags on that, on that smokestack. So we made, we made, we made a uh, commando raid on the high school the night before uh, school opened. Uh, I climbed the smokestack, which meant there were big uh, cables coming down from the lightning rods that were about every eight feet were hooked into the uh, block. I climbed that thing up and put a, a Confederate flag on all four lightning rods, thinking that it was summertime and the boiler wouldn't be on, but it came on because it was heating the water. So I was up there with, with the fumes coming out. And the next morning, uh, Everybody was looking at those flags. They tried to get the fire department in there, but the hook and ladder couldn't get in there. So those flags stayed up to Hurricane Diane took them down. Uh, I look back now at it, but uh, what, the point being, I was too too stupid to be afraid of doing stuff like that back then. So uh, so that's why that's why in Vietnam. Uh, I can think of two experiences where I can actually remember having some sense of fear. Uh, so that idea that that stupidity and is an insanity is right next to heroism and valor is very true. I was too stupid to be afraid. Uh, I, I see I see guys, you know, see some of these films and guys are going on missions. I think uh, I think. Uh, uh, Cliff Newman, I think he said it on the SOG video that, you know, saying about what am I doing this again for? Uh, my my thing in going in operations was like going up to make a 12,500 foot jump. It was excitement. It was looking forward to it. It was that adrenaline rush. Uh, and I, I look back at now and say, was there something wrong with me? But that's just who I am. You know, it's not. That's who I was back then. I'm. I've always been into sailing, you know, I love the repelling, I race cars. So, so it's, I'm an adrenaline junkie and always have been. So this idea that overcoming fear, I wish I had. <laughs> Living your best life. <laughs> so um, on, on that, I mean, that's interesting. So, so you're, because I've heard other SOG guys say, you know, I definitely felt fear all the yeah. time on my missions, but I controlled yeah. it and I, lit, and I, and I, I kind of rode the fear. And, and oh, you're saying well, my first enemy contact, okay? Uh, I've been on multiple patrols. Nothing had ever happened. It was just nothing around 10 foot. And, and uh, don't have to get into all the details, but wandered into, by mistake, an NDA battalion headquarters that was obviously on its way to Tam Key for Ted of 68. Uh, I always followed right behind my, my point squad. This is a CIDG operation, you know, 100 hundred Vietnamese, couple of American advisors. Uh, I knew I knew something was weird because uh, I had fallen behind because of wait a minute vines. We got out into some elephant grass. I was following my point squad's trail and the, and the trail split in the elephant grass. So uh, I knew we weren't the only ones there. 
I followed the downhill side. I got to an area where there was a bomb crater and some fallen trees. When all hell broke loose in front of me, and my point squad started rushing back at me. Uh, what do you, all the training is attack, attack, attack. I didn't have time to feel afraid. What I did was jump over that damn tree and assaulted, right? Now, when I did that, if I'd been by myself, I would have been in deep duty. But the guys that were running away, they did what military stuff said they were supposed to do. They turned and followed me and the rest of the company followed them. I didn't have time to think about being afraid. And, and then we did our thing there. We collected a bunch of intelligence for Ted and 68. Then our little guys spooked because they realized we had made contact with an NDA battalion. And they ran all the way back to the safe area. And that's when I realized the training in America had not been tough enough because it was keep up or be the only American left behind, got back, and it was like any other Special Forces mission. You get back, you get debriefed, you go about your job, and it's kind of like Tilt said in, in coming back from that mission, you get back to the, the floor show, and uh, so you don't have time to be extra afraid. You learn very quick in an environment like Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, that you can be brushing your teeth in the morning and get killed. <laughs> so, so a little more dangerous, a little less dangerous. And that's why a lot of us did such risky things in Vietnam, because at least that was fun. It, you know, we were putting our life on the line, but we were doing it because we wanted to, and we were getting some fun out of it. So, yeah, my whole thing with fear was uh, uh, when my radio got went dead on that last mission, when I was talking to my fact on that Prick 35 thing, whatever the hell it was, and it went dead, that freaked me because instantly I knew without contact to that fact and we were under fire, this was bad shit. And I was two weeks short coming home. And anybody that knows when you run recon these things, you don't go out 30 days short. So, and I had an ad hoc team. I had never been on the ground with either one of these guys before. So I had a right to panic a little bit. Uh, and the other time was uh, doing the overflight for that mission when uh, I was in an O2 and we got some weird static. The pilot started doing some weird flying and told me that uh, they had locked on with any aircraft. And I was in that pilot oh, Lord. airplane without a parachute in my 45. So uh, first time I, I felt a little nausea. I'd never get air sick, but I can remember getting a little nausea and then it settled down. But I, I relate that to the two times I can remember actually being afraid with, afraid with all the stupid crap I did. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, that, that, would, that, that takes some beating, to be honest. I'm, I mean, you know, even a bit of abseiling makes me, my legs go a bit funny. And you, you have to kind of get a control of it, you know, lean back and do the abseil. But, you know, just for you guys just jumping out of a plane and you're, in, you're going into combat as well is a completely different world. Uh, well, it is one of those things. It's one of the reasons that uh, you say a different world. It's one of the reasons veterans are, are only, are almost only helpable. That's not a good grammatic sentence. It uh, can only be helped for the most part by other combat veterans. Uh, I don't care what kind of trauma you've been through or how many years of school you've had. Uh, if you haven't got some, you know, we, you, that used to be empathy. Empathy used to be a direct connection to that trauma. Uh, uh, until you can understand what it's like to spend a year in graves res registration in Saigon, not out getting shot at, but dealing with the bodies that were shot at. That's, I mean, I can't imagine that, you know, and what I, when I get, and it's been recently, this is most what I've gotten, and they're beautiful young ladies, they're friendly, that they're, they're, they're great people, but I tell them, uh, there is no way I will ever be able to empathize with a woman giving birth. Frankly, I don't want to be, I don't want to watch a movie with a woman giving birth. I am so squeamish about it. So for me to tell a woman who's pregnant that 
man, I feel so badly for what everything you're going through. I can walk around all day with 100 pounds on my chest. I mean, it's just until you've been there, you don't know. And combat is the most radical example of that. Uh, and it's one of the reasons we had so much trouble in Vietnam was because of the uh, no censorship. World War II, great deal of censorship. The whole country was behind the whole country was behind the war and involved. Right? If they weren't fighting, they were working for the for the 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 war effort. But the ladies making the bombs didn't really see the blown up bodies. They were they were isolated. Vietnam body count every night. The worst stories about the war. Uh, I tell people some of the greatest satisfaction I have memories of is working S5, supplying refugees with food, going out on med caps. You know, what our medics did for the people, the stuff that doesn't get in the evening news, right? And it was the same in Afghanistan, Iraq, not only special forces, but I mean, we did a lot of good. Uh, we do good as a military. It's not our fault if we lose support of the population and the politicians. Um, but uh, but that that was my greatest satisfaction. It wasn't going out and play shoot them up. That was a whole different ball game. Mm. And and so because you were a medic in A one hundred two in your ODA. No 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 no. I was a junior intel sergeant. Ah uh, okay. So yeah, and then, and then uh, I became an E6. Uh, Sergeant First Class, class Beals came in right at, out of training group. He was in E7, so he fell into that slot. Mm -hmm. I couldn't be his junior because I was an E6. So because the team wanted to keep me on, they just made me the S5 NCO, and that was cleared through the C team. So right. I was never a medic. I mean, yeah, so. But there was on... on uh, the, the, my uh, the guys I was with in Richmond uh, thought I had been killed in Vietnam because uh, Specialist Phillips stall at A one hundred two had been killed at Ashau, <laughs> so there was always some confusion there. But anyway, yeah. So, um, so what was the mission for A one hundred two? It was a, a you know the the typical A team mission, uh, primarily. Uh, Potential interdiction uh, you know, in an area where the NDA might come through. Uh, it was in the area of an old French fort, uh, and uh, our talk had been that. But uh, when I first got there as the intel sergeant, when I got my, my briefing from uh, my counterpart, an old Viet Minh sergeant, uh, I was told that the, the BC in that area, there were three women who had one old French Garand rifle that uh, fired some weird caliber that they couldn't get ammunition for. Uh, we had a couple of BC uh, inside the CIDG, uh, which, uh, you know, my thing was why, and he said, because we know who they are, which made sense to me, and he told me the precautions and everything. Uh, but that was it. Uh, we'd go on operations, the pictures from that operation, so our, show our CD, CIDG, very casual, no noise discipline. I went out at Fort Arms. I mean, I'm all rigid. Uh, later on, I found out there was kind of that written thing with we would make noise so the VC would know we were coming, would make contact. And, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so there was nothing happened there. Nothing. The whole time I was there, it was primarily boring. Uh, things were starting to heat up a little bit just before I left. Uh, I left because I'd been hanging out a lot at, at House 22, the CNC safe house. I don't know how I got vetted in there because you had to know somebody who knew somebody. Uh, but it's been a long time ago. But somehow I got clearance to go in there which gave me a hint of what, what they were doing at, at, at CNC right up the road from me. And uh, so that sounded pretty good. So I requested an assignment there. I didn't know really what they did, but it sounded really cool. Um, and that's when I was offered the job of the S5 NCO there at the C team. And that sounded really cool. I didn't know what the other one was. 
But uh, and again, one of the, those things that you make these decisions and fool with your own destiny. In that case, is when I got to fly with Air America all the time, mm-hmm. and, and uh, I got to do some really neat things with Air America, including fly that big old caribou. Uh, but I still wanted to go to you know I still wanted to go to Sod. So that's why after German language school, I volunteered to go back to Vietnam and having been there before, having earned a couple of baubles my first tour, when I asked to go to CCN, and I was on the next bird up there, uh, it was interesting getting there. You know, Plaster talks about his introduction. Uh, But I begged to go. to. I wanted to run recon. I told them I wanted a recon job. But again, they were hurting for an intel guy at the launch site. And... At the pleasure of the military first, I went to the launch site. I did a good job as an intel sergeant there. So I actually, I had to struggle. I had to fight to get into recon. And that's a story of itself. So, so, uh, kind of show. And by then I can remember at the launch site, you know, sending the teams in, monitoring them, doing the extractions, which was a really cool job. But I can remember when they would lift off there from the launch site, we'd be sitting out there. I can remember watching them until I couldn't hear or see them anymore and wanting to be on that helicopter. And, and, and constantly, I mean, I had good jobs. Uh, before I got into recon, I had an air-conditioned office. I mean, I was my, the hardest thing I had to do was type. Uh, I could have hung on to that job for for till the war was over, and I fought to get into recon. So, mm. are, you, are you able to tell us about your flights with Air America? Oh, I can tell you. I, all of these stories I wrote them out a long time ago. They're very crude, but uh, I've got one story where where uh, Gene Hassenfuss and I made the three unauthorized skydives over eighteens. Okay, we're not talking about big, uh, big landing zones or big DZs. We're shooting for the for shooting for the runways. Uh, a lot of these areas were mined around the A team, and outside of that was uh, hostile territory. So uh, it, it's like our highest one from fifteen four, I think it was. Uh, we had flown out there. Check the wind, you know, have to, you know, but this is down in a valley, flew back to Da Nang, loaded up. I manifested the loads. Uh, when we flew back to, uh, was it Min Long? Geo- I'd have to look at uh, my log now. It was the farthest one out, so we had a full fl- hour flying out. Air America pilots being exactly like the movie depicts them with Mel Gibson, uh, instead of leveling off at, at 1,500 feet or whatever, they just kept flying climbing for the full hour we got to 15 four and we kind of looked down and jumped out we were doing relative work uh can you imagine the air force letting us do that and and of course we were getting wind directions on the ground for the plane to land but we had no idea if, if you're not familiar at 15,000 feet winds can be blowing in a weird direction at 100 knots so our chance of landing, you know, I, I jumped out of airplanes and my distance to target was a 15 minute walk. So the fact that we made these three jumps without telling anybody totally unauthorized, uh, we got in a situation once where uh, somebody on the ground hit the plane, right? Shot at us and hit us. Uh, they were kind of pissed. Brown came up through the, through the deck of the aircraft probably two foot from where I was taking a nap. Uh, we went back, and, and the next day I manifested loads to the same place, but I had gone down to our weapons pool. I checked out an M19, A6, uh, 30 caliber machine gun, several several boxes of ammos, the tripod, and a case of grenades. And this is one of the weird things of special forces I was just an E6 S5 NCO that didn't know anybody. And I was able to go down to the weapons pool and walk out with that stuff. Right. And uh, so anyway, uh, the next that day we went out and protect. We flew over the same area, 
pilots pretend you know, they, they screwed up the mixture on one engine, so it was smoking. We pretended we were crippled. Kicker and I, Eugene Hassenfuss, Kicker and I watch him. We started taking ground fire. Pilot picked up that engine. I st- opened up with the A6. Uh, I had fixed these hand grenades so that they would either b- bounce, you know, get ground or uh, air. And <laughs> so, so we armed the caribou and fought back. I mean, uh, the other thing was the only high altitude free fall cargo drop in the history of the military. I did it by myself with Air America. And I point this out as this is special forces. If you don't have what you need, use what you have, but get the fucking job done. And my my OIC, Captain Orr, come to me and said, Cam Duck's under siege. Thong Duck, I can get the ducks confused. Thong Duck is under siege. Uh, again, that was the closest A camp to Da Nang, so a major route coming through there. Uh, they're down in the valley. Uh, they've got plenty of ammo and everything, but they're out of food, and the Air Force has refused to fly in. They wouldn't even do those low-level extractions off the runway because Charlie had an aircraft above them and had the, had the whole area zeroed. Oh, boy. Uh, and they wanted to know if the Air American guys and I could get, get some rice into them. And dumb asked me. I said, sure, we can. And then I thought, started thinking about it. But to try to make this a little shorter story, I put the way to drop that load and free fall it until it got closer to the ground. Then the cargo parachutes open, and I put four pallets of rice right along the runway. Uh, and this is one of those things, again, where we got that mission done, went home, we flew back, and it was like that crew and I are in... Captain Orr, who was unfortunately killed later, are the only people that know about it. But it's pretty cool that, that I was able to do that, putting my rigor skills together with free fall skills from skydiving. You know? And uh, uh, so, th- I mean, Air America was just a blast to fly with. And Mike, did you jump with those pallets or did you stay in the aircraft? No, no, no. Them free okay. Fall? Now, what, when you, what you watch Colonel Lynn talk about, Okay, uh, I went over there and, and to his place, and we talked, I talked nonstop for probably six hours with him asking me things. We just talked about everything. I rambled, and then he put that video together. And I'm sorry, Colonel, and I talked to him about this. He cross-wired my, uh, my two tours. He had me doing the free falls for for SOG, which which I did no free fall for SOG whatsoever. I never dropped pallets in North Vietnam. I talked to him about it, and it was either take it down or leave it up. So I said, well, for most people, it kind of generally covers the thing, and they're not going to understand anyway. But he cross-wired that. So, so the skydiving... And the, the, the pallet drop were two different things with Air America, my first tour. And that was the Got second it. half of my first tour. My second tour, the only thing doing with the skydiving there is he made a big thing of the sharpshooters, our, our stupid little club we had there. And, uh, uh, and of course, that was the year that I was made area safety officer for South Vietnam, which is is you'd have to be a, a, an old parachutist to understand the irony of that. And I did go down to Australia and made some, some cool parachute jumps down there. I'm one of the few guys. I didn't go to Thailand to get laid, and I didn't go to Hong Kong to get a Rolex. I went to Australia to make parachute jumps on r and r which was cool there, too, because uh, I got to fly down to uh, – uh, uh, Jesus – uh, okay, you got Saigon, uh, Saigon, you got Sydney and uh, Melbourne. Uh, I got to fly down to Melbourne, which was totally, I wasn't supposed to leave Saigon on r and r but I guy flew me down to Melbourne. I went out to his private uh, jump drop zone and got to make jumps the whole time I was on r and r So, wow. so there was a lot of, cool. lot of misstatements in that. Uh, hmm. I, my, I, 
this this is how weird when I talk about you know you need the whole thing of getting to the to the uh, drop zone at uh, uh, where I jumped that side of Saigon was a thing that the train ride this whole thing is a long story that that I won't get into right now because it's an aside. But as I'm walking up into the airport, they're doing a jumpathon. They're raising money for the Australian parachute team to go to the world meet. So they got these jumpers making as many jumps as they can. They got all the people from that area are hanging around there at this little county airport donating money, right? So as I'm getting on, I hear this PA system and it says, uh, he's all right. I mean, he was, he, he's badly injured, but he's going to be okay. They're coming to get him. What had happened was, their star jumper, the guy that was going to go to the meet, had streamered in, and they were over there picking him up with a sponge. <laughs> okay, so, oh, no. so they didn't want to panic the crowd or anything because there's women and children out there. So they're trying to let the crowd know that he's injured, but okay. I get on there and turn around the corner, and I meet the guy. He tells me what's really happening. Uh, the, the executive di- director of, of the Australian Parachute Federation. And I had all my gear with him. And I he was talking about keeping the crowd, you know, not wanting to get all upset or anything. So I had my PC with me. And so I had a, a reserve on the back and my main on the back, but I had D rings and I did a lot of cutaways. So I actually ended up with a blurb in an Australian newspaper uh, by a uh, press release from them about making this cutaway jump in Australia, but they didn't say I was from Vietnam. They said I was a, an American from Florida. So, <laughs> so I, I made a made a made a jump in Australia that got me in a newspaper article. So I mean that was my R and R. It was a unique experience from what most guys did. I mean, lots of guys, you know, went to Bangkok and spent the whole week drunk and getting laid, but I, I went to Australia and skydived. A true sounds steward like, of the profession. Yeah, it sounds like heaven for airborne, doesn't it? Um, so, <laughs> so um, given all that fun you were having, Mike, um, how, how can you tell us a little bit about how you um, earned your first Silver Star? Uh, that was that operation I was talking about. Uh, Sergeant First Class Beals and I, he was the guy that took my place. Uh, we were on one, one of those routine patrols, nothing going on. We were about a day ahead of time. And I like to point out to, to people that don't know, we were just advisors. We we had no, our value was able to get, we were the only ones able to get American air support, artillery support, or medevacs. If we were on the radio, our Vietnamese friends were in deep doo-doo. And there were only two of us. Two Vietnamese Special Forces advisors, the Look Long Duck Viet, LLDB, which we called Little Lousy Dirty Bastards, because a lot of them were there for per- political rather than military skills. Uh, and so there's a hundred uh, kind of trained CIDG carrying M1 carbines. Uh, this is another thing people don't understand. Our troops were not carrying M16s. And when we got into deep doo doo, uh, our guys were carrying M1 World War II M1 carbines, while the bad guys were carrying AK-47s. So anyway, we're kind of a, got an extra day uh, that we uh, got nothing to do. And I told Beals, I said, "Hey, you know, we we've never been in this valley, you know, over this this little mountain range here. Let's let's just go over there and see what's going on, just for the heck of it." Because I was prone to do stuff like that, so we did. We. Uh, uh, talked to our advisors. They had no problem. We hooked a right up into this this little gully like thing going up into the mountains. Uh, started getting light, so we made camp for the night and uh, out in the middle of nowhere, which was unusual for us because a lot of times we would just we would do our RON in some uh, abandoned hamlet, so we would be in some sort of a hooch. But we're out there and. Uh, uh, before first light, of course, it's still darker than hell, triple canopy. Uh, uh, you break out in the morning, get your gear together, can't see anything. And this was a, a cool experience that I had not had. Uh, we're leaving in trail and you can't see anything. So how do you follow the guy in front of you in pitch black? 
phosphorescence. The leaves on the ground had a fungus on them that glowed in the dark. So you take one of these damp leaves and stick it to the pack in front of you. And you're walking along in absolute darkness with this ghostly image bouncing along in front of you. Uh, finally, it started getting uh, a little light. And uh, uh, about that time, the guys in front of me went through an area uh, that was real tight, one, uh, the, the wait a minute vines, the whole night in yard. So when I tried to get through, I got hung up. And, and it took me a while to break three, free. And then I was following their trail, right? No problem in the jungle uh, for, for somebody well-trained like I was, right? Uh, so I'm following their trail, trying to catch up with them. And that's what I mentioned earlier. We broke out into some uh, some elephant grass and the, the trail split. I went downhill, went through the thing with the assault, right? Uh, that the uh, citation says I took out a uh, an automatic weapons thing. I don't remember that. <laughs> okay, I actually don't remember. Uh, I do remember rushing in. I fired. I uh, I remember rushing into the hooch, and there was a uh, a Vietnamese woman. Uh, most of these hooches out in the pre fire zones had a, over in the left hand corner for some reason there would be a a, a hole with an access to a tunnel of like the bomb shelter. There was a lot of blood, a woman laying half out of that. There were some packs on the table in the middle, and I could hear a baby crying down in the hole. Uh, I went over to the hole, it was dark, and you could see it was like a nail. There was a down and then off to the left. Uh, there was a lot of action going on in the area. Uh, there were some other people came in. Uh, through the interpreter, I was hollering, come out, come out. We won't hurt you. Uh, come out. I was, I can remember being worried about the kid down there and kind of imagining that there, you know, there were probably NBA down there with all these packs and stuff trying to put it together. Maybe some, some civilians. Uh, stupid things go through your mind. Uh, I, Actually, had dropped my pack and pulled out my 45, and I was going to drop down in the hole. <laughs> One of the Vietnamese oh kids standing there pulled a pin on a grenade and threw it in there. And uh, I backed off, and it was a dud. So I, I was wow. going to get into the hole again. And, and I think back now, my whole friggin' focus was on this kid. Who I would have guessed the cry was maybe two, three years old. And uh, that's when they set the hooch on fire from the outside. And, and we could do nothing but get out. I do remember carrying a wounded kid up to a hill because there, no, no, uh, there was no LZ right there. But uh, the guys had, while this was going on, somebody had found the LZ. So I carried this Vietnamese kid up there. And uh, it wasn't fear, but it was excitement because I knew how to land a helicopter. Unfortunately, uh, I was facing into the wind when I was trying to set him down. Uh, and uh, the crew chief watching the spoke knew that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. It was the first time I did one of those things, you know, bringing him in. And as soon as he turned him around, I knew what the hell I'd done wrong. But it wasn't out of fear. It was all that adrenaline pumping. Uh, and it was right after that, uh, I got down with my folks uh, down around the Ville, that uh, that the Vietnamese spooked. My guy spooked. And, uh, well, I take it back. We started an orally withdrawal uh, to get my to get it right in my mind. It's been a long time. We started an orally withdrawal out. Uh, there was some rice paddies. We went up a hill, and, and it broke to the left. And that's when we saw some NVA tracking us. They were coming uh, online across the rice paddy. And that's when my guys spooked in that area. Uh, time frame kind of sets in here with me because uh, we were out of range of our Marine 105s, but we were doing a joint operation with the 101st that had 155s there. So I was able to FO a mission with the 155s. 
uh, that were firing right over our heads. And that's the first time I had that experience where it feels like you can reach up and, and grab the artillery around where you really hear them scream. Uh, so I, I called in a fire mission there. And that was strange because the Marine tubes were so old when I called in a fire mission. They were just naturally splayed. I mean, they were hitting in the target and hitting around the area. When I called these 105s in with 101st with their new 155 tubes, I had four rounds go in the same hole and one about 10 meters out. Uh, and uh, I actually didn't know the splay command then, but that was enough to stop the NDA and enough for my guys to start running. And they, like I said, all double time all the way back to uh, the A camp. I can remember I wore glasses. I can remember jogging along, uh, trying to, I don't know where that it was. It was a route by then. It, it was, if, if, if I, if it had not, if we had not turned it into, to an attack. It would have been a rout at the very beginning, that NBA battalion. Uh, we were up against a mountain. Uh, they would have taken us out, but that's when it turned into a rout, but we were running. And uh, I can remember a pond fronds hitting me in the face and my glasses fogging over. And, and I can remember thinking that those runs in jump school just weren't quite tough enough. They <laughs> did. Which, of course, if I'd gone through ranger training or SEAL, you know, BUDS class, it would have been, I would have had that kind of experience. But uh, but that, and, and uh, actually, uh, uh, not just, I, li I, li I like to be honest here. Uh, uh, Sergeant Beals came to me when we got back, and he said, hey, I'll write you up for a Bronze Star. You write me up for a Bronze Star. And I said, you know, basically, he was new in the, in the team, and uh, uh, I told him, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and I don't know where the Silver Star came from. I was in German language school, and uh, it was the only real uh, – uh, well, it was a normal award ceremony. Later on, when I got my second award, it, award, it was a fiasco. It was sad. But uh, I have no idea where, where the story came from, who put me in for it or what. Um, and uh, I've said many times I have two bronze stars for service, and I'm I am proud of that because to get those decorations, one had to do a good job consistency for a full year. You had to do you know above and beyond. And at that time, uh, for an enlisted man, that was the highest award you could get for service. I don't know what it is today. Today, they get a ribbon for getting out of basic for crying out loud. It's the, the everybody's a winner mentality, which kind of pisses us old vets off to see a guy with a, with a rack that's got eight rows of ribbons and the top one is his good conduct medal. <laughs> you know? But, but anyway, uh, uh, yeah, so that's how it came down. I, I said, you know, they say you can't you can't show valor unless you show fear. Quite literally, I did what I was trained to do. I did it right, and I was a good soldier. And if some, my thing was, hell, you know, if I'd stayed in the army, it would have helped me get promoted faster. But then I may be seven in just over seven years. So, uh, and the sec second silver star was pretty much the same. It's it's being that person in a situation where you get press to to the limit and through luck that last operation if that had been somebody out there you know some what do they call them the guys that go out to war games and you know the uh the judges that go out and say who's dead and who the won OCs. It. yeah if they if it had been those guys out there i would have been kicked out of special forces if that had been a robin sage exercise i did everything wrong i made every wrong decision terry cunning who took off his web gear and when I gave the signal to saddle up, stood up to put his friggin' web gear on and, and cause them to sh hit us, he did everything wrong. But that's what saved us. So the point being in combat, you can do everything right and die and you can do everything wrong and survive because of what happens in combat. <laughs> so again, you want to recognize me? It makes the unit look good to have more decorations. I don't care, but 
But uh, <clears throat> but I was just doing the best I could in the situation, and uh, I can look back, and we should have been killed. Here, here's the deal. When we got hit, all right, I was planning, uh, we're getting into the second Stover Star. Do we want to go that way? Well, we're going from the first contact yeah. to the last. Yeah, roll with it, yeah. Okay, I mean, I don't want to go against your agenda here. I, okay, so uh, so it was supposed to be a POW snatch. They didn't take our bait. We heard engineers down on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, we thought, explosives. That night at about uh, 0200, a, uh, I think it was 17 trucks. I remember it had three tracked escorts. That was verified by uh, uh, Air Force Intel with their listening devices. Obviously, they were tanks. So during yeah, that, tanks. in our RON that night, uh, and it sounds it sounds like you're right next to the trail. You could know, hear that clank, 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 and the roar of engines. Uh, we were going to assault, right? We 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 had come up with the idea to call in an airstrike when they were working down there, and during the confusion try to go in and snatch one of them and, and be extracted. And how many people uh, did you have with you, Mike? Uh, I had two Americans I had never worked with and four mountain yards. Okay. So wow. there were seven of us. <laughs> and, and uh, after it was over, when I was debriefed, uh, they said that in that Valley, there were probably three crack reinforced NVA battalion. So good Lord. Uh, we didn't have enough to uh, surround them, but we could give them a good fight. <laughs> okay. uh, but but the but the thing was m- our plan was to try to to try to salvage this POW missing. And don't maybe as a side we'll get into how dangerous the target area and, and nobody been in there for a full year uh, before that, which is why they wanted us in. But we, we came up with this plan. We had moved out onto this little finger where we could see the trail and uh, come up with this plan to have fast movers come out there, start this airstrike, and we'd have, have extraction. We'd be all ready to get the hell out of there. Uh, but, but I couldn't get a fact. I mean, should have had a fact at first light. And it wasn't until just before 10 o'clock. Now, this is an interesting thing for recon. Without a fact, we have no comma, right? You guys know that, right? Mm-hmm. We have to have a fact. It's 10 o'clock in the, in, the, in the morning, and we've had no radio contact. Should have been one there at first light checking on us. My first night ever spending, actually, well, my second night, but my first night in this situation on the ground, right? Uh, so... What I ended up doing, we had radio relays, uh, C-130s, I think they were. You guys probably, Hillsboro and uh, Sunshine, Moonbeam. I think. Moonbeam, right. For a long time, I confused the call signs. I thought it was Moonbeam and Sunshine. And then I found out it was Hillsboro, and Hillsboro County was the next county up for me in Florida. So I should have remembered that. But we'll get into memory maybe sometime. But anyway, I contacted... In the daytime, so that was Hillsboro, right? Yeah. And they contacted their headquarters in Saigon at Tonsonu, who called CCN on a landline and told them they had a team that needed a fact. <laughs> okay. Wow. So, so finally, just after around 10 o'clock in the morning, my fact comes out, and, and I'm on that radio, that Prick 20. Uh, 35 thing talking to him and i first thing i did you know, checked in everything's fine uh told him my plan which was dumber than hell okay and and he calls the c team he comes back up on the way to me and says okay your plan's been approved so fast movers were being scrambled right then when I turned around, let my team know, you know, we're moving out because they all knew what the plan had been. That's when Terry Cunning, my one, two, I was aghast. I mean, I couldn't believe it that a recon guy that had gone through one zero school would actually take his web gear off. What at, at the same time, I watched his belly open up. It was just his guts just spilled out 
and he fell down. Oh, no. Uh, that's, I keyed the radio. That's kind of when I panicked. When I think about going through the story. I keyed the radio, and I said, prayer and fire, about 100 times in the next three seconds. Right? It was like, prayer and fire, prayer you know, because that was our, get me the hell out of here right now. And when I released the key, it was dead. There was no, there was no radio. <laughs> so, so uh, I reached down. I got that that uh, little uh, that little URC ten, the URC ten, that little UHF radio. Pulled it out, reestablished comms, right? Told the fact. Actually, called you know I called in my prairie fire then. And uh, gave him the, the, the tactical information he needed. He rolled in and put some rocket fire right where we were taking fire from, which, keep in mind, again, we had no idea where they were or who they were. Now, was that the fact firing rockets? or Yeah, like, yeah. Really you know, I mean, yeah. Uh, and like I said, we were, we were taking fire just out of elephant grass. And maybe maybe 20 meters, that dangerous close bullshit, right? And, and uh, so he rolled in and put some, did some really accurate fire. Uh, right after he got there, the fast movers got there. But when he put rocket fire in, the whole valley opened up with anti-aircraft fire. And, and uh, to put it into context, uh, the target area... Right where the DMZ comes across and meets Laos, where the Ho Chi Minh Trail came down there and bottlenecked. Uh, that was the area they did Lam Son uh, 7 Wayne 19 out of. But where the trail came in out of North Vietnam in several places and, of course, went into South Vietnam in several places, everything almost went through that one bottleneck there. That's where I was and why it was such a... a, a, a a high need for intel from that area. Well, that whole area opened up with 20 Mike Mike, I mean, 37s. And, uh, but in the meantime, right, now that the, the air, the fact rolled in, now it's time for me to get into the firefight, right? I had done as much as I could do right then with the radio. My car 15 was laying across my lap and I reached down with my left hand to pick it up and my hand wouldn't close on my car 15. It would just drag across. Now, I had no pain. I didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, if I may be gross, I had taken shrapnel through the back of my arm here and had taken out two of the nerves to my left hand. <laughs> so uh, uh, <laughs> so oh that's God. when uh, Captain Carell... Uh, and as an E-7, I had a captain as an assistant team leader, very unusual. Uh, experience over rank counted then, right? I mean, that's, uh, which is something the SEALs, to me, don't understand. That uh, when you're meeting an officer, uh, well, that's not get sidetracked there. <laughs> anyway, okay, so he he's the one that crawled over and uh, you know, bandaged me up. I was bleeding profusely, obviously. Uh, so, uh, I, what I, I, what I was doing, uh, you know, was directing the airstrikes, watching where they were, uh, opening up, telling the fact where from my position, all of that stuff, directing airstrikes all through the valley. Cause obviously they weren't able to get slicks into me until like they stopped all this, this inner aircraft that took four hours. Okay. Uh, for them to suppress that enough. In that amount of time, oh, also, I got to interject here. Uh, early on, the SPADs got there, and they rolled in and put cluster bombs right across that area. This is an important part of the story. Uh, Captain Carell and I were maybe uh, eight meters apart. Uh, on, the side, uh, on, the, on the side where we got the assault from, we were on a finger, so it was downhill, steep downhill everywhere else. And the rest of our, our team was down on the finger nail, so to speak. So we're, we were up uh, where the ground fire was coming from. And that's when that SPAD rolled in. It, it's SPAD saved me the, the mission before that, dropping napalm on us. So, <laughs> But anyway, he rolls in uh, with his, his cluster bombs, comes up. You know, you see him come up the hill. Boom. 
a cluster, one of the bomblets landed right between Captain Corell and myself. Oh my god. I know god. because it was looked like a a medical capsule. It was that shape and it was bright yellow and it landed right between us and was a dud, which you know a lot of those were. So again, how many times can you escape? death in one because if it had been good it would have taken out the whole team it wouldn't have taken out Corell and I uh so so I started uh losing so much blood I was having trouble so I turned the team over to Captain Corell but I kept uh trying to spot and I had my signal mirror that I was flashing so that everybody would be sure because there's a lot of crap going on in the valley right now Finally, it was suppressed enough where they got the slip to come in. Uh, the uh, crew chief, I'm not sure who it was at that time, but uh, because I think it was Butler, Jim Butler, I think was my bright light, but I don't, there were only two guys on this chopper. Uh, they came over with the stretcher to get cunning, put him on the stretcher, and uh, I was telling uh, my assistant team leader to get the hell out of there with, with some of the other guys. And he wouldn't give me, obviously, once you give command away, it has to be given back to you. And he very brightly told me, hell no, you get the hell out of here. Uh, I'm in my mind. I mean, I've lost a lot of blood and I'm thinking first man in, last man out. I can't leave the team. But that was a bad tactical decision because you don't leave a guy like me behind. You leave healthy guys back. So uh, so I scooted along behind the two guys, uh, Kerry and Terry. I ran ahead to get to the helicopter to help them put them in because I knew the, the what we called rope ladders, which were really aluminum, you know, you guys know. They were in there would be in the way of the stretcher. So I jumped in. Same shit. The one guy put the handles of the stretcher up there on the on the side of the chopper. I'm trying to pick it up. My right hand would grip, but I couldn't get my left hand to grab that handle, so I had to get the hell out of the way. Uh, so obviously we got him in and we left. Uh, I've been in touch with Captain Carell. He's still around. He became a Baptist minister. Uh, they came in to get him. By then. They knew what the hell was going on. So when the rest of the team came out, they shot out his windshield. Uh, so they flew all the back, way back without a windshield. Uh, so that was the operation. I was in the hospital there at China Beach when they came in to debrief. Uh, my company commander, who was not even airborne qualified, he was a leg intel officer down at uh, Sog and Saigon that needed some command time. Okay. War was running down. They sent him up to be our company commander to get some command time. And he's the guy that uh, that gentle propositions thing had me go out when I was two weeks short. And it was uh, with an ad hoc team into the worst AO in Prairie Fire. Uh, he stood at the bed with his head down. He didn't say shit to me. But as usual, you know, when they make those visits, a lot of people would come in. But when they debriefed me, okay. I don't know if you know about what we called the beeper. It was about the size of a pack of cigarettes. And I wore it on my web gear right here. And allegedly, if we turned that on, Spooky would know where we were. And Spooky could sweep the whole area. If I told him, my team was like, we're all within 10 meters of the beeper. And supposedly, the Gatling gun was supposed to quit firing when it swept over the team supposedly okay so i had that beeper here an ak round had gone through that beeper this way wow okay the reason the radio went dead i was under the assumption it had gotten hit and of course it was would have been in my one two's pack you know stretched out reason it went dead Somehow, either while I was talking on it or when I was talking, you know, giving the hand side to them, shrapnel had cut that cord three inches below the handset. Wow. Jesus Christ. Okay. So 
the idea that my team got out of there at all with no KIAs. And Terry, Terry Cunning, the AK round that hit him had just done a simple a, a, a simple flesh wound across his belly. His gut spilled out, but nothing was hurt. Okay. Uh, so he oh, he God. was in the next ward over in China Beach. I went to see him. I was in terrible shape with pain because of the nerve damage. And this is another experience. People who make war should spend some time in, in uh, hospitals that are going, you know, when they still have guys that are suffering burns and, you know, this kind of crap, that's an education in itself. But anyway, he was on the next ward over. I went to see him. You know, they cleaned him up a little bit and stitched him up. And when that flesh wound was over, he was going to be fine. Meanwhile, I got medevac to, uh, you know, well, I'd, that was at Contree still. Uh, no, I met him up at, you know, uh, uh, China Beach. And then I went through Japan and it was medic retired out of Walter Reed. But that was, that was the last operation. When I got the mission, uh, I was told to specifically not to brief my, my, my mountain yards until we were uh, in route. I mean, we were in the insert because normally you brief them because uh, the last team to have been in that AO was Michigan. And uh, they had gotten uh, hit on the LZ. They got broken up. The brew had swung back around uh, to get the Americans to see all three Americans executed on the LZ. This is the story I was told, right? So my brew were the last team to be, be in there, and it was a year before, and that mission didn't go well. So, and and this again is I was given the option, and you know, we were supposed to be able to deny a mission for any reason, right? If I just didn't feel like it. And when I was called in and I had already uh, had that mission scrubbed once before, which is why they wanted me to do it. Uh, and I told the new CO, I said, sir, I said, you know, I'm two weeks short. I said, you know, told him about the traditions. And he, he told me, he says, I'm stalling. He said, either your team will take this mission or you and your team will be out on the, out on the beach filling sandbags until you de -rose. And, and I'm just the kind of guy that said, well, fuck you, then I'll take it, right? But right. but that tradi tra traditions of SOG were breaking down. That was that was in 71, and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, I should have never been a 1-0. I did not. I mean, I had a lot of combat experience, but I did not have many missions as a 1-2 or one way, work myself up. Uh when I when I finally made them, and I did this by screwing up an after action report, I, I sent a terrible after action report that I was right because mine were always very good. I just let one go. I didn't care. And, and the major came in. And he says, "Unstall." He said, "You really want to go to recon, don't you?" And I said, "Yes, sir." That's how I got into recon. Went did one mission with Sergeant Horton. We got shot off the LZ. It's like he left the next day, and uh, I never had a team. Every mission I did, it was just guys that weren't doing anything else. So, and I did, uh, I did one bright light by myself with the team. Went in with uh, the surviving team member. Uh, so, is that, I mean, is, was that Jim? I, I, did, I didn't know that much, right? I, I mean, uh, I hadn't been. It's so compartmentalized, you know. You don't know until you see the other side of the curtain. So I didn't know till much later, I mean, after Plaster wrote his book and stuff like that, how everything else went on. I didn't know that about the halo jumps until they made the made the history uh, channel documentary. So you, you mentioned Horton. Was that Jim Horton, was it? Uh James Horton. Jim, yeah. And yeah. and he was he was wounded on a bright light trying to get uh RT intruder uh, guys back. Um, uh, I I don't know. It it's like uh I remembered that name, and I, I could be completely wrong. I mean, obviously, memory is so screwed up at, normally, but when you get into a combat zone, black re is remembered as white. Uh, but I've always kind of remembered that name. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
But when when uh, uh, Sherman brought out his books and I talked to some other people, they told me Horton was never on Michigan. I don't know. I mean, I was. It was like I don't even remember the mission bre- briefing. It was well, like. Well, a lot of people um, strap home, didn't they? And and so you never know because um, I've been looking at February seventy one, the mission where Cliff Newman um went out with and they and they went out with habu with rt habu but there were uh-huh. six there were four additional strap hanger americans and two other indigs on it and that's when jim horton got um got his foot um you know almost taken off i think and he he finished up uh you know getting sent home because of it so that was february 71 so it was a bit later yeah i see and and obviously things get crosswired but but even in, in Sherman's books, which are great, you know, but where he talks about my silver star, he has correct, uh, he has uh, cunning in the next operation down. Uh, so, so I know from personal, you know, my stuff that, that with all of that data, it's amazing that there aren't tons and tons, but we know now even on the wall, as much as they bragged, it was 100% accurate. Now we know there's tons of errors there. So, you know, after this many years trying to put it all together, who was with whom, uh, I uh, I didn't remember any of the people that actually ran with me except uh, Carell and Cunning, and that was only because of the last operation. And Hardy, uh, at uh, a, few, uh, so, a, a few sores ago, actually hooked me up with my one one from the operation where I had to call napalm in our opposition. And that was an ad hoc team. And uh, uh, it turned out he had been living uh, near uh, right outside of Fort Carson the whole time I was living two hours from Fort Carson. And and I had to move to Ohio to run into him in uh, Las Vegas. But uh but it's interesting, you know, when you do hook, and that's another reason why I'm not really on the inside with SOA because because of this idea that I didn't run with anybody and, and form these strong bonds. But uh, but there's you know there's there's a lot of gaps in the history after all this time, and I don't trust my own stories anymore. Well, I bet I bet the um, well, we we enjoy listening to them, and and I and I'm sure that you know I'm sure your recall is really good because you know they, they feel real. Um, and I, I'm thinking about you're saying about um, remembering people. What about the Indic forces that you ran with? Do you, do you remember what it was like working with them, and and anything particularly you know that really stood out? Uh, much more for my first time with the Vietnamese. Uh, oh. I had my own interpreter there at the C team for six months. He cried when I left and I still have his, he gave me a little ivory carved tiger and took me out to dinner in off limits, off limits French restaurant. I mean, I, I bonded with, with, with the Vietnamese that I was with. Unfortunately, again, the traditions breaking down and, 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 and I had my brew, uh, when I fir- first got introduced to the team, again, it was like weird to them because I had run with them as a 1-1 one, one or a 1-2. Uh, first thing I did with them was uh, go with them down to Marble Mountain because I wanted to see inside the damn mountain. So we just we just walked down there together, just me and my brew. Uh, I liked to free repel, so I made sure they knew how to repel. So I know I trained with them because a lot of things you do in routine, you don't remember. That's how I ended up on that bright light by myself because my team knew how to repel. Uh, when I got back, I can remember uh, a lot of stuff happened to me. My wife left me because she was pregnant because she'd been fooling around. I lost my army career. You know, it was it was like a real time of turmoil. But I can remember taking a loose leaf folder and writing their names down so I wouldn't forget them. And much later, when, when I started trying to think about who I was with, I started freaking out because I couldn't even remember Americans' names, especially my second tour. Mm-hmm. And I felt so guilty because I felt like I was dishonoring them. Uh, but mm-hmm. now my... My, when I was with SOG on my eight on the on the launch site, I became real tight with Dai Fa. 
the, uh, the, the Vietnamese guy there. He didn't speak any English to speak of, but the only thing I did as an area safety officer for the United States Parachute Association was that I got him an, uh, a, a U.S. Uh, skydiving aid license. And after I did that for him, he, we, we bonded and uh, we stayed friends even into the SEAT team. And I, we did some cool stuff together, uh, uh, stories that would, you know, that are those, those interesting asides that aren't combat stories. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, that my relationships is when, when I made friends with Vietnamese, we got real close. And I, and I think I was, when I flew, when, when I was on the 18 hour flight on my first tour, uh, I read the novel, The Ugly American. And, and that book is relevant today, but in it's a fictional novel that takes place, obviously a fictional novel, redundant. It's a novel that takes place in Southeast Asia and talks about our arrogance. And so I, I think it helped temper my, my attitude when I got there. And uh, when I first got to the A-team, it was probably the next day they took me down and introduced me to my counterpart. This guy looked, looked about 100 years older than Ho Chi Minh. He had fought with the Viet Minh against the French. I had just got out of training group. What was I, 22 years old or something? And I'm his advisor. <laughs> so uh, went, 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 down, went down there, you know, with uh, probably top and uh, my interpreter. I think it was uh, Tom. It was Tom at the time we called him. His name was probably Tam. Uh, but went down there and when it was just uh, the LLDB sergeant, myself, and the interpreter, I told him, I said, look at man. Not I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I said, look at man. And I told him that. I said, you, you, this is your war. You've been here forever. I just got here. The idea of me being your advisor is ludicrous. You tell me what you need, what you want me to do, and I'll do my best to support you. And he loved me. Next day, he took me down to the bill uh, with his, with, uh, it was his sergeant major, his, his Vietnamese sergeant major, and he they didn't speak any English. Took me down to the ville and bought me some some Vietnamese food, you know, dirt dirt floor carcasses with flies hanging on the wall. And uh, I wasn't into hot food. I didn't know what the hell we were eating. I was following him. He did this thing, took a big bite, and I had no idea what all those little things were floating in that sauce, that nook mom. I did the big thing. I took a big bite, and it was like jalapeno pepper time. I had tears uh, coming out of my eyes. He's rolling on the floor. And I said, okay, I'm in. When you get a guy that, 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 that does that kind of a joke, you know, when you first meet him. But, I, but that was my attitude with Vietnam. I didn't have that American arrogance. I, you know, I did as best I could to learn some of the language. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so I, I, uh, I, I miss the Vietnamese. I like a lot of SF guys. I really hate the way it ended up and the, the promises we made that were broken. Uh, sure. Sure. I went into a Vietnamese restaurant in Ohio in Columbus. First one I'd ever seen, right? I where I was living in the boonies. And uh I had my Vietnam stuff on. I always the only and when I'd go in, you know, I'd always say, you know. Chow bam and you get in there, you fall into the language a little bit, which again, it's that thing of American speaking their language. And the damn owner came out with a with a South Vietnamese flag. He was waving it and came over to my table and he was thanking me. And again, he didn't speak any English, but to for him to run into a Vietnam veteran, you know, that uh, was special forces and worked with Vietnam. It, he he was it was it was just a cool experience you know but it's, it's uh, uh, I I I think you need that in special forces you need you need to have not all of us did but you need to have that that in in embracing other cultures and uh, you know we know how far some SF guys took it <laughs> sure sure did you did you pick up any like what kinds of skills did you learn from him. Uh, that you hadn't learned in your own training? I don't think any. 
I, okay. I, you know, you know, really, uh, the training was so, even though too much of the training in special forces was still geared to World War II, uh, you know, fighting the Russians in Europe, you know, the kind of, you know, the, the intel training I had was, was, you know, identifying down pilots that had, you know, been shot down and, and they're trying to get back to, and they're not Russians. And, uh, sure. but nonetheless, uh, I volunteered to go to Vietnam in 65. I mean, right after, right after it went public, right after it became a real war, I was there at Richmond and, and, uh, it went up and down the chain of command and, and I was denied because of my rank in MOS. If I'd gone to Vietnam as a par- parachute rigger, which they didn't need and they put a, uh, you know, an M14 in my hand, I would have been dead in three days. It was that special forces training. Uh, that kept me alive. I ha- I had a, a platoon sergeant in basic who told us, okay, guys, in the next week, we're going to teach you enough to keep you alive for your first three minutes in combat. In that three minutes of combat, you better learn enough to keep you alive for the rest of the war. Okay. And that's what I found to be true. Okay. that uh, so, so there wasn't anything uh, where... You know, like you see in the movies where there's all this, you see something different in this insight. Uh, sure. It was working together and uh, maybe if I'd been with the brew longer, I'd gotten tighter with them. Yeah, it sounded like you had a kind of a tough experience because you never had a consistent team. Well, um, yeah, and that's, and again, I mean, it's just, you know, my degrees are in behavioral science. I studied uh, social psychology, human communication. So, so these things that have happened to me relative to special forces since I've gotten out, I can understand that. It's just I'm one of those guys that was always kind of doing my job out here by myself, and I I didn't form those strong bonds. Now, uh, uh Sergeant Harris, Leland Harris, my my uh, my uh, uh, team sergeant at Ten Foot, we got tight. I mean, uh, I visited him after Vietnam uh, before he died in 2010. Uh, he made a tour of the country, visiting all the guys he he had served with. He was dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, so, but again, uh, you know, I I I'm. Once visited uh, Flint, the uh, the demo guy that taught me all my demo stuff, you know, did my cross training. But we were all over the country. We didn't have Facebook and the stuff that are today. And those guys have all died. Everybody that I was actually tight with are gone. Uh, So when I go to the reunions, I see the tables and everybody that, you know, and these guys served in the 5th, the 10th. They were down in Panama with the 8th together. Uh, they don't know me. So I was, so it, it, it kind of, I feel very lonely there. I'm glad to see them. I wish I had somebody to reminisce with, sure. but it becomes a very painful experience for me to go to the reunions uh, when I don't have any to union with. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, oh, but heavy. the other side of it is I've got all these cool experiences that I wouldn't have had if I had spent a whole year in an A team, I mean, or if I'd spent a whole year in recon, I say just recon, but that's a use of it. These guys that did recon, I had one of my best buds I made after, after Vietnam, we met working for the post office together. He was a mail handler. He had been Project Delta B-52, which did the same thing we did, but in country, basically. Uh, he had a, a Vietnamese and ditch team uh, he had gone in the army and was a, a dental technician working with an aviation unit in Saigon, did a lot of strap hanging and flying in and out of the SF team. So he re-enlisted for special forces, uh, was a, 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 a weapons man. Uh, he got shot up during the recon for Hamburger Hill when the 101st did the Ashtrao. He, w- he was team leader on the team that went in to recon that and got his ass all shot up and medically retired. His view of special forces was so narrow because that's all he knew was weapons. And all he knew was that recon. 
He had no idea about civil civil action patrols, all those other facets of special forces. And I I find that with a lot of SFers who who like me didn't get the opportunity to spend a lifetime in special forces. And even even when I when I I didn't find out about the Special Forces Association until I met Terry in about 85, 84, 85, when I joined. But but even then they had the decaders and the rest of us. I I had only been in special forces for even if you include training group and language school, three and a half years, but you know, only two years wearing a beret. Uh, so I couldn't be a decader. Yet I'd spent those two years in Vietnam. I was highly decorated. I did a real good job. I could have been poster boy for special forces, but I, I couldn't get a D. I was a general member, an A. Now, years later, they changed that, right? But even, even when I got out of the, when I found in the 80s that there was that, okay, it was a matter of how much time you did not what you did while you were there, which I think, you know, was, you have to have some way to measure, but it comes out of the, I got this dog driving me crazy, sorry. <laughs> yeah. it, it came out of the body count. It came out of, uh, mm. of our uh, body count from Vietnam on how that should keep score. Everything has to fit a pigeonhole. It's interesting. So, what, yes. what you, just to jump in, what you said about, um, you know, the Facebook generation and everything, just, just last week, um, I was in an email exchange uh, with Ken Bore and uh, Frank Pulley, who were on RT Idaho. And um, they've just made contact with Zwan, um, who, who was who's one of the last surviving um, indigenous members of RT Idaho, who lives in, in, uh, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and, and he saw, uh, heard about them and knew that he could reach out and, and found his way through and we got him connected <laughs> so just to see them trading photographs and memories and oh, you know oh, it was oh, fantastic oh, a absolutely i mean it just boggles my mind uh now as the internet was starting uh we had a special forces bulletin board back in the old bulletin board days where a lot of us hooked up and uh but obviously not the same thing and then and then then some of us hooked up email uh, I can remember back when the first national phone directories came out on DVD, and I bought a set of those, and I went through region by region, every name I could ever think of. And uh, actually, I sent out postcards. I had a dot matrix printer with, and, and, and I mean, I had it all. I sent out hundreds of postcards to possibilities. Uh, I was real tight with the medic, Doc Hefner, on my A-team. I mean... He got there about the same time. We we bunked together when we went into the C team. Uh, and I knew he was from LA and he talked about his family having a General Motors dealership. He had a his name was Hefner and uh, had a kind of an unusual spelling. So everybody in Hef that was Hefner in the Los Angeles area got a postcard from me. I was actually in the hospital uh, in a psych ward. Uh, in the Denver VA, when he called me, one of my postcards had gotten to one of his uncles. He was living up in Hamilton, Wyoming or some damn place. But that's what we relied on, right? And and, uh, <laughs> and I actually hooked up with some people. Now, the strange thing, too, was I found out that uh, one of my weapon sergeants from the A-team was down at uh, Fort Hood. And I made a trip down there to see him. I traveled down to reunite. I got down there, stayed in a motel, uh, went to visit him. He did not offer me a cup of coffee or a glass of water. Sat there, tried to kind of bond with him. He was one of the guys that got kicked out of SF after none, which a lot of guys did, right? They, and he got assigned to some leg unit and had to do the rest of his career as somebody that had the SF experience in Vietnam and then got put back to the regular army. So, you know, it, I couldn't understand it then, but with age, hopefully comes a little wisdom. And I look back now and I can say, yeah, you know, that, that 
he had a burr under his blanket about the way he was treated. So, uh, so those those reunions for us went hot and cold. Uh, uh, I uh, I re- reunited with some people like Bruce Taylor. Uh, he he Martin Harbite and I did not run together, but we just bonded over a stupid experience at the launch site. And uh, I don't even know if it was back in email days or whatever. And uh, Brew Taylor was such a cool guy. He was from Alaska. His plans at the time, he had a girlfriend in Thailand that he was going to marry and take her to Alaska with her. And we <laughs> we talk about that. Uh, after the war, he stayed in Southeast Asia. He's got a, a kid that he's had trouble getting out of Thailand. He worked in some sort of uh, humane thing up in northern Thailand where he was helping refugees and stuff. So like a lot of SFers never came back from Southeast Asia, the guys that went to the Philippines and, you know, and, uh, uh, but that has been an evolved thing. But even like with Brew, I, I found out what happened to Martin, you know, our bike. Uh, I, I, I think I heard when I was in the hospital that he was, while I was at Reed, uh, he had gotten killed, but I didn't get the story until later from, from, uh, from Brew. But I had to get off of Facebook because all of the political crap. I mean, it just, you know, it stopped being, it stopped being, uh, you know, old SFers getting together. It just, and uh, I, I check in every once in a while, but uh, so, so that tough. that is kind of disrupted. This political bullshit is is disrupted. Yeah. The, ah, I don't even want to get into it. Of course, a big difference in Vietnam too is that the first units and teams that went over were integral. But then we did the thing that that in my era where I went over as an individual, joined the team, guys came on, old timers left, other new guys came on. So that 12 man team had 27 guys on it in the six months I was there. So with a few guys, you'd hook up and bond, but uh, you didn't have that cohesion uh, that you had in a, in a in a unit where guys were constantly with each other. So there's a lot of factors here. Uh, yeah, we didn't get our home our homecoming parade. How could they? You mm-hmm. know, it was the the and even World War II vets, only the first ones off the boat. You know, there were guys still coming home two years later. You know, the nurses and and, and they didn't get homecomings. And by the time they got home, there were signs in the windows that said "No dogs or GIs." So you know, we forget a lot of that history. Uh, so it was just on television every day with us non vets and uh, so going commission. back to SOG, yeah. yeah, yeah. You go ahead, I was gonna say going back to SOG. So you're coming to get on the helicopter. How do you feel yes. when you're going out on a mission? What does it what does it feel like? Can you remember you know do, do, uh, does it... God, I hate, I hate to say this. Uh I guess if I were gonna relate it today, it would be like getting into the Uber to go to work. It was a means of transportation to get me where I wanted to be. The same is when I got into an airplane to jump out of it. It was a means to the end. And, and uh, I looked forward to my missions. I, I'm not saying it was smart. I'm saying, I am saying I was smart enough. Uh, my first contact with my team as far as doing something that somebody else told me to do was going up to, uh, damn, I don't know if it was Hickory or Leghorn, one of the radio relay sites, so active security up there. Mm -hmm. So I get up there by myself uh, with my mountain yards. First thing this this, uh, combo captain up there wanted me to do, the OIC, was do a security. He wanted me to leave and do a little security thing around there. Well, we were socked in. And I tell him, "Go, go screw yourself. Because I knew that my team needed air support if we got in contact. I knew that if we were going to get hit right then, that compound would be better off with my team there than out lost in the fog. So this other new team leader says, I'll take my team out. So he leaves. (laughs) A few hours later, he comes up on the radio calling a prairie fire. Uh, He... 
reported that they had been ambushed and had gotten rocket fire and that he had injuries. And my thing is now, oh, fuck, now I got to go out, right? Yeah. Now I don't have a choice. Yeah, without so, support. So, again, I have no idea. I mean, uh, these these images we have of the past. I can remember at one point uh, there was so much uh, brush. We were out. It, there wasn't any trees, but there was so much brush. We were climbing over like one inch branches that you could look down into the dark and it must have been 20 foot down to the actual floor of the jungle. And we were trying to climb wow. climb overall and trying to make sure we didn't fall through. How we find these guys, I don't know, because it had to be strict land navigation with bad maps. We started to get what I thought was probably close to them. I took point because I didn't want one of my little people to bust, bust out into guys that were already on alert who had been ambush got into the area and what i smelt was not cordite but ozone okay got there one of their team members was actually up in a tree with a broken leg they had been struck by lightning they had not been hit what <laughs> the team got struck by lightning Oh also, my God. you know, the smell after a lightning strike, if you've ever been near that, and growing up in Florida, I've been struck by lightning too many times, that smell around electric motors. Yeah. And, and uh, we had a medevac, luckily, the, the, the clouds opened up just a little hole, a, a CH-46, a Marine CH-46 came in and pulled this guy out on a string, and the rest of us had to spend the night there and walked out. But uh, <laughs> so he was in a tree and the tree got struck. Or? I don't know. what I, I don't know. They didn't know what the hell went on. And I'm I'm coming into the accident after the case. Right. Yeah. These guys are all days. They believe they had been hit and they thought it was rocket fire. But the smell was ozone. There was no sign of any rocket. I couldn't tell you what where the lightning hit. But there was one guy in a tree with a broken leg, and uh, it was monsoon. We spent the whole night being rained on, and, uh, and that was one of my memorable nights wow. in Vietnam. But but weird weird stuff happens. And uh... <laughs> yeah, I read that. I read that on your website, and I when I read it, I figured the guy had probably been blown by the lightning strike into the tree, and that had busted his leg. Well, that that I mean, the whole thing. I. I and lightning strikes are weird. I mean, people have been hit by lightning more than once. And, you know, it's not not what we, the mythology about lightning. I don't know. I walked in and that was my assessment. <laughs> but the thing being, the point being was that when he told me to take that off and I knew that my team would be in jeopardy because not being able to get air support and I was able to tell him to go fuck himself, I did. Uh, so uh, it wasn't that I was reckless. Uh, same as skydiving. There's no way in hell I was ever going to jump out of an airplane intentionally with only one parachute that wasn't crashing. You know that, that it was all. I after after Vietnam, I was fooling with my my gear. I was going to junior college, and I had three malfunctions out of five jumps. Oh uh, man! So uh, yeah, I, and it's always that confidence, knowing that that you know what you're doing, trusting your equipment. And not doing something stupid like jumping out of the airplane to test drop a grid and having it the only one you have. So, uh, yeah. or going into the DMZ with a team you're not familiar with, you know, um, by the sound of it, from yes. what you're telling us. <laughs> yeah. So, Wait, can um, you, yeah, go ahead. Can you go back and just talk a little bit about SOG and the recon missions you ran? What did your kit look like when you were doing that? What kind of stuff did you carry? Mm. Okay, uh, contrasting, because I can contrast with running with the CIDG, where you probably weren't going to make contact, where you pretty well knew the terrain. And even then, my first missions, I ran out of water. And I mean, I, I mean, it, that was a learning experience, OJT. Uh, when I got to recon, uh, all I remember is a lot of ammunition. <laughs> right <laughs> a lot of ammunition because there was going to be no resupplies 
And keep in mind that all that before I ran recon, I was inserting teams, extracting teams, doing after action reports. I was well aware of everything that went on in the field. It wasn't like like I was some green guy that really didn't understand. But I, I really can't tell you. And a lot of that, again, is that memory thing. Believe it or not, uh, I, can't, I can remember some places where I spent the night. But when I was working in the talk, I can't tell you where I live. I have no memory. Hmm. I spent a year there, either in and out of FOB4 or staying there working. I don't remember eating a meal there. Not hmm. one meal. And according to other guys, we had steak every every Sunday. Uh, it was barbecue. You know, we had a, a barbecue grill and we had steak every Sunday. How can I spend a year at a place? And sometimes, you know, you say, oh, I don't remember such and such. And somebody says, oh, don't you remember? It was that white concrete building. You say, oh, yeah, now I remember. I've had guys sit and explain in detail. And it's a freaky feeling. It's it's a form of amnesia. So when I talk about anything, it, it's, it's like, well, you should remember that. Yeah, I should. Uh, when we had the old belt bulletin board uh, thing going on, I brought this memory thing up. And a lot of SFers started popping up with, yeah, I spent two years there and I never remember it raining. I was in the Delta and uh, there was a Regon guy that came up. I, he was a one one. He said they're the one zero. They did their insert. It was uh, uh, they were supposed to be watching this trail. He and the and the one zero low crawled up to the trail and low crawled back. He got in touch with the one zero years later, like we did. When Zero started talking about the mission and talking about uh, how freaky it was that they crawled up to the trail, and just as an NBA company started going by, and they were in a position where all they saw was the feet, right? Oh, so yeah. they watched like 200 feet go by. The guy I'm talking to had no memory of it, okay? So, so these are examples of when you tell, ask me, you know, and I... Did I have this vest or whatever? Yeah. Uh, it's sometimes hard. So the only thing I can remember is a lot of ammunition, all that survival gear, every bit of survival gear in the right pockets and, and everything. Uh, a damn little food. <laughs> yeah. But but enough water to get me through the mission. Uh, and, and that's and looking beeper. back now. And as if somebody gave me that mission now, what I would be looking at. Uh, yeah. I know we use canteen covers for, you know, instead of the BAR belt because it they carried extra. I know we never use more than 17, 18 rounds uh, because of the, you know, there's certain things that are ingrained in my mind. But a lot of this stuff, it's scary because I was there and I don't remember it. Even when Captain Carell and I, when we finally hooked up and talked on the phone years and years after that mission, Things that I couldn't figure out how it happened. He was able to give me perspective. But then from his perspective, I was able to tell him, hey, Daiwi, it couldn't have been that way because. So it took both of us, and we still don't have it right, obviously. So mm -hmm. so some right. guys speak with a great deal of confidence about their memory. They're bullshitting. Yeah. They're bullshitting. I'll ask you right now. Out of the last 365 days, how many actual incident memories can you put together? Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> maybe 10 question. or 20 yeah. or something. Yeah. You yeah. live a lot yeah. of your life and don't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and and I, I bet when you're under that amount of stress, too, whether you realize it or not at the time, that's got to exactly. impact what your brain's prioritizing. Oh, oh yeah. You know, short term and, versus and, that long term. Probably. And of course, in my academic field of behavioral science and mental health and in communication, and in teaching memory, you know, passive, active, short term, long term, uh, the creativity of memory, it becomes an important thing in my field. So when I apply that to where I've been, I have very little confidence anymore in what I say. I mean, sure. up here, I'm sure, but I have to realistically say, this is my memory of it. Yeah. Do you Dude. remember at all, like uh, when you were out doing recon work, how what what would it sound like if you came across you know 
or if a team came across an ele- enemy element, how would you report that to your fac over the radio? What would that sound like? Like, was it because nowadays there's salute reports or salt reports where it's like you say yeah. size, yeah, activity, uh, location, time? Well, well, to start with, you wouldn't have a fact all the time, mm-hmm. right? So, so the idea that I would immediately be telling a fact that I had observed something, that would only be your fact might be there for a little while, first light, a little while, last light to make sure, because you got more than one team on the ground in limited facts. And if you get a team in trouble, then they stack up. So this is another thing I know we use. We use those little encrypted pads. And when we had contact, we would send them a very short message that was actually uh, in Morse code. And, And I've seen pictures of the pad, but I don't remember how we used it anymore. It was a one time pad that like uh, they would device? have that same pad. And we wrote out a very short message that translated to a different letter. And then we would send the message, Alpha, Charlie, Indigo. Oh. And, and, then, and then we would that pad would be destroyed in the next message. They would tear off that sheet. I kind of remember that part about it, but that's when we, when we would actually send those messages in. But I never had that opportunity. Okay, <laughs> those are those those are things in my training and and being on the launch team. Uh, but uh, I never had that opportunity. So you're saying you had a you would have had a little um, like a little booklet or a little something yes. that had like an yeah. encryption sticky code. notes. Think of yeah. sticky notes, and yeah. and you can find you these. That to I'm, send your I'm sure Tilt or somebody can can point you. Because I found pictures of them in Google, mm-hmm. looking for other stuff, mm-hmm. and, and it, it, we called it a one-time pad. That's all I can think of. But I know it yeah. was Morris, but it wasn't Diddy Dum Dum Diddy stuff. Sure. Uh, but yeah. that, but we could send unencrypted that way a very short message because obviously they did do RDF on us. So uh, yeah, uh, and uh, but you the thing with that code. encrypted radio, that was the dumbest thing in the world, and it. it I mentioned in the emails, thinking back now, I can't figure out why the hell we ever took it because the whole plan was to transmit in the clear to have this bogus team emergency and pretend yeah. we left when we didn't, knowing, I mean, here's your intel again, knowing because it always happened, the counter-recon team would come out to check up what we might have done, so we were going to be slick and ambush them right there on the LZ. Yeah. Uh, that went south 10 minutes into the mission, which everybody knows. And so, Colonel Dick my, Thompson, he said that even with that, that, uh, what's that encryption device called again? Um, the, I always the, K, forget. the KY 38. The K, yeah. KY 38. He said, even well, with well that, I, I, I found Jeep mounted jobs and, and a lot of them, but I had trouble finding the actual radio and, and what I could only think of as the potato masher. I mean, I know how it all worked. Uh, but, you know, it was really weird when I was trying to write my stories and, you know, just mostly just fooling around, not thinking anybody would really look at anything. I was trying to find pictures of everything because I'm a big uh, show and tell kind of guy. And uh, I was in touch with Johnny Jacks, the commo man, and he was still in communication down in Louisiana. And nobody, I mean, I would describe it and they didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And they were porting pointing me to all this ANC stuff and not being a, a combo man. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about, but it was only somewhere along the line because I was finding all of the ones you hooked up with the prick 25 that encrypted or the, the Jeep mounted stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then nobody's ever heard of, uh, of the how tar either. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, the, uh, a 104 millimeter how tar that the Marines bought. That was a four deuce mortar on a howitzer carriage that you could tow around behind a Jeep that the Marines finally gave away because it was famous for its short rounds. And the Marines gave us two of them on my 18, and they were Ooh. instrumental in the Battle of Howda. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I've, ca- I've talked to all kinds of cannon cockers and Marines that have never heard of the, the 104 millimeter howitzer. <laughs> yeah. Huh. 
Is that then like wheeled? It's got like wheels and stuff. It's towed. And oh it's yeah, it's got car. two wheels on it. I've it's, seen it, pictures of stuff like that. It, it's I've got a saying. picture of it. If you want me to, I'll email you a picture of any of this yeah, stuff that I, like I talk it. about. Yes, please. but but it's my thing about Vietnam. When I talk to people, when I was in Vietnam, I was concerned with everything that happened to me within ten meters, hundred meters out. Little more concerned beyond that, I could care less, and so. In Vietnam, so many of us had so many, again, this word unique. What I experienced was different than what the guy, the next company over experienced. And I've heard non-vets get in arguments about how things were done, failing to realize that we, everywhere in Vietnam, it was done OJT kind of, you know, according to that unit's command or what, yeah. what was available there. So, uh and it's the same way with that with that darn uh, suppressed M1 carbine that I had. I wanted Everybody's to just say, did, did you did you mean this and did you mean that? I said, no, World War II M1 30 caliber carbine. And then when you think about it, it's just a little bigger than a 22 with a little more, a little bigger round, and it was perfect for a for a, a POW snatch where you weren't face to face with the guy. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to tell Rob about that because I'd never heard of a suppressed M1 carbine before, but that was a pretty cool thing to hear your story. Yeah, well, again, you know, when I start talking to people about this, oh, yeah, right, you know, they think I'm bullshitting. Well, just because it you didn't see it doesn't mean it didn't exist. You know, yeah. it's... That's, Mike, that, that's why I sent you the photo because the thing that I sent you has got a Browning High Power 9mm magazine in it. <laughs> And a scope wait, on top. Wait, <laughs> wait what? When I saw that, that's why I said it. That was to really laugh my ass off because that's what I run into all the time with, with younger vets. You know, I talk to them, damn, I trained with the M1 Grand in basic training. We still had the horseshoe pack like that. You know, you see them make combat jumps in World War II. That's what we looked when I jumped out of an airplane in, in, in Benning. They, these guys don't understand that that. We didn't have all that high tech stuff. <laughs> well, well, that that carbine I've sent you the picture of is some uh, field mod bastardized version. You know, okay. it's, it's not some high tech, you know, um, yeah. out of China Lake or something. It's, yeah. it, you know, it, it was literally, from what I understand, it's what some guy did in country. You know, well, I, I found it funny too because until I got uh, the copy of Jason Hardy's book that I'm in. Uh, I didn't know that Terry Cunning was a sniper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, when I got the mission and I'd come up with this stupid plan that they approved. Remember, a lieutenant colonel approved that plan. So it wasn't all on my, on me. But uh, uh, I don't know how I, I got a hold of that M1 carbine. I mean, that's what I would, would do when I was what I called the li liaison NCO when I was working in the talk. I would get the mission and the team, and then I would work with that team leader to get him whatever he wanted to accomplish that mission. But how somebody, I mean, how I ended up with that radio or that weapon, I don't know. What I, what I do remember the most about it is taking it down to our little range and practicing with it to get the feel of it. Uh, and it was just, like I said, it was just an M1 carbine uh had the suppressor on it and like a hunting scope uh our 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 snipers they went to sniper school they used m14s that were all glued into i mean it was all you know for them so this whole mission ad hoc was just very weird and of course to get medevac out of there and going through the the hospital system and and not being there in 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 the aftermath of it to talk to these guys uh kind of puts me in a in a very bizarre situation uh, yeah. captain Correll, uh he wouldn't run recon anymore he took over as the team leader of mlt2 uh, the team i was on this is another thing i don't remember i don't remember the insert we launched out of the launch team that i had been the intel sergeant on and i don't remember it I had asked Carell where the hell we launched up from because uh, the first time I was supposed to run the mission with different Americans, uh, I was uh, at uh, Hui Fu by Camp Eagle launch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got food poisoning in their mess hall. 
And by the time I recovered from that, the weather had closed in, so the mission was scrubbed. Uh, and it's when that mission hit again that they wanted me to take it. Yeah. But that's that memory thing. It is anybody you talk to that says they know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's got to be got, interesting. You've got me thinking now. There's, there's a launch site that I think FOB1 became it after after Fubai shut down and I can't remember the name off the top of my head it's on our map in the game yeah. we've actually got it on there and we've got a camp there and we had, we run a mission out of there but I can't remember the name of it um and I and I'm I'm a younger guy and I was only in that camp last Sunday and I can't remember <laughs> it <laughs> it's the one we run the Marbell wiretap mission out of Sam do you remember it it's the little triangular camp oh um to the northwest of Fubai yeah because if you're going to I, DMZ, I yeah, I, the DMZ I that would be that would be the launch video. site, I reckon. For 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 Sog in yeah, seventy exactly. on seven, nineteen seventy, um, if it's not Fubai, it's going to be that that one because because they shut Fubai down, I think, and then they moved it to this other place. And I'm, well, and it's not that, that, it's that, like, it's that not whole planning. FOB thing. I mean, and, and launch yeah. teams and all of that. Even when I was there again, maybe because of the compartmentalization, I was on two. I Obviously, knew there must have been a one and a three. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at Kwong Tree, uh, but but later on, I heard about launch teams at Fubai, and I was going to launch out of Fubai. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was like you didn't worry about all those little details. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it was when I was working out of the talk that I had a team la la launch out of MKP Thailand, and I flew over. Uh, I escorted the team to Thailand. And uh, that's when I, I caught, caught a hop down to Saigon to get, get my uh, parachute gear from Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander Rice. But I mean, again, uh, you don't, when I was there, there was just not a lot of worry about all of that other detail. Uh, yeah. Too much concerned about here now. Talk about being in the moment. You know, all this, this stuff today is being mindful of where you, that was the norm for me in Vietnam. I didn't care what was going on anywhere else. So uh, it gets well, very, very confusing even for, for me that about where all these launch teams and I never heard the uh, Marble Mountain, uh, FOB Marble Mountain uh, until a few years ago. I mean, there's terms that were used there that, that I feel like an idiot because I'm just hearing them. Yeah, my, my lock. That's the, that's the name of the camp. I'm not, I'm not sure if you remember that, but it was... No, Milok. Milok, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it may have been that, because that was that was what was used after Fubai was closed. Uh, but that's yeah, the they, thing. Uh, they, they, I guess some teams even launched out of, like, Quezon. There was some... some, some, some but, but that's the way SF worked, you know. It, it's like whatever you needed, that's what you did. Um yeah, Dacto as well. I mean, anywhere up around the border, you know, uh, that you could jump over from, um, whatever's close. But it, it, it's so strange, even even uh, between Thong Duck and Cam Duck. Uh, mm. uh, I know both very well. Uh, my my MI POW MIA bracelet is Cap Moore. He was my old IC when uh, Cam Duck was being overrun. He flew out there in a one thirty to help extract the refugees. That shot down on takeoff. He was MIA until I guess about ninety five when he finally found his remains. So I have that connection. Then at Thong Duck is where I made that really cool airdrop. Every time the was the yesterday, I started thinking about that. I had to open up my map of the eight teams in Vietnam. To, okay, now Thong Duck and Cam Duck. So uh, so. Things get crosswired. I try to keep myself straight. I'll look something up, but uh, uh, memories wander. I guess you'll probably remember your car 15 and the first time you had one. Uh, nope. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, basic, trained on the M1, introduced to the M14, uh, AIT, went to rigor school, didn't see a weapon for the rest of my tour except to uh, be a range NCO when a bunch of lieutenants were going to qualify on their uh, 45s and one of them damn near shot me. Uh, did not see an M16 then until I got into SF training, uh, which I thought it was such a 
cool weapon. Uh, carried that in Vietnam. Always wore a 45 wherever I was. And I don't need, I, of course, I had seen the M16 and played with it before I actually carried one. But uh, it was just a cool weapon. <laughs> the collapsible stock. Wow, that was cool. But it was still a piece of shit. I mean, they, they could put a, what do they say? You can put, put uh, makeup on a pig, but it's still a pig. It was still a piece of a shit weapon. <laughs> Played by the lowest bidder. <laughs> I, I mean, even uh, one, of, one of the tips I got, I remember, uh, or of course, we carried the two magazines up and down. Wouldn't even think about using a 30-round magazine. I, my, my God, the 20 rounds didn't work. I think it was Plaster that ordered the first 30 rounds. I never saw one. But uh, one, one of the things was was that to have the Americans all have uh, all uh, tracers in the first two magazines, because if you get in a firefight, all those tracers psychologically. Right. So. Uh, so I, I first time I went in was in certain with a Marine Marine CH-47 and uh, Marine gunships escorts, which fired flechette rounds into the LZ before we touched down, which leaves great big clouds of red smoke over the LZ at two o'clock in the afternoon. It's like a cartoon thing with, here they are, guys. Here they are, guys. So <laughs> we did did the did the earn cert with them, but uh, we got hit almost right away. And I had two magazines of tracers. I fired about four rounds and had a jam. And it was a good idea, but it was after that that somebody said, oh, yeah, the tracers, they have a tendency to jam like wet rounds. So <laughs> oh man so uh that was that's when when i had the experience where thank god i had my cleaning rods uh because i had to clear that jam and dump those damn tracers <laughs> and that's and that's the mission where uh we had to drop napalm danger clothes we all got na napalm burns on us but it was either uh let let the spad drop it there or we were going to get overrun so it was if he if he had dropped a tenth of a second later, we would have been the crispy critters. Wow. wow. <laughs> so so you say burns, was that from the flash or was that from actually blobs of napalm? That was from globs of napalm. Okay. Wow. It, to explain the operation, think of a finger, right? Going downhill. We're on the low side, counter recon team is just above us. Right. So anywhere we run, we're going downhill. I and mean, obviously they have a tactical advantage. Uh, spads were still on station. We hadn't been inserted that long. And talk, I called the prayer fire when we got hit. Uh, had spads on station, told them the situation. We were in enough canopy where I had to use a, a, one of those little pen light flares to mark our position. Uh, Spad had napalm. Now, normally when they make a run, they try to do it. If you if you put a line between the bad guys and the good guys, they try not to fly that line. They try to fly over the bad guys next to the good guys. But on that particular terrain, if he flew in that way, he was even a little short or a little long, he would miss them. Mm -hmm. They're flying in over them and then us, he could drop short and still get them. So uh, I had to approve, right? It was like, this is what he can do. This is what his suggestion is. So I told the fact, go ahead. So the fact tells us, okay, he's on his run. Get your head down. We all ducked down. I couldn't help myself. I was peeking up a little bit. He comes over, you know, you hear that spad. I mean, when they come down low over. I was looking when I saw coming through the jungle, you see the movies, you know, Apocalypse Now or whatever, that roiling red, yellow, black, just and it was moving at me like a wall. I ducked, and all of us got little, little tiny burns. And and my only assumption is the timing was such, obviously got the bad guys. And the napalm was all absorbed by the jungle just as it got to us. Uh, unfortunately, that major was shot down about a week later and died. Oh, no. But uh, 
but it's it, that's one of those things that, that as a team leader, I had to make that decision that if we didn't have this drop, they were going to overrun us, potential of capture, really bad times. Uh, if I make the drop, he might miss and kill us, but we're still going to be ahead in the game. Uh, and wow. again, I, I mean, I, I can say this just matter of factly, and I, I feel that way now. That's, I mean, I mean, I can remember the shock looking out the windows of that CH-47, <laughs> See, seeing the Marine gunships. Uh, but then I found out later, too, that the Marines would not risk air assets without flechetting the, the LZ. So that was that was standard with the Corps. It's, yeah, when we were first researching napalm for the game, we needed to know what it sounds like when it goes off, when it's near you. And, and I asked John Plaster the question and he said, well, you know, if it's really close, you'll hear it crashing through the trees. Like the actual canister, <laughs> yeah, you're the other <laughs> and, and I just thought there's nobody on earth that you could, you, there's no way you could find that information on the internet, right? There's just what does it sound like? It's like, well, you can actually hear it crashing through the trees above you. And I just thought, <laughs> oh my god, what a life! Well, well, it's funny you should mention that because if somebody asked me that, I wouldn't know, yeah, yeah I mean, you because I was right there up close and personal, but I was, I mean, the whole amazing thing the visual was overwhelming and i swear to god if it had overcome me at the time it would have been just like the rapture <laughs> you know it wasn't fear it was just that 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 spectacle and uh but again then when you live with with life and death every day it's it's you can appreciate that as if it were a nice sunset or a pretty rainbow it's it's well well uh tilt again talked about that contrast when he talks about how beautiful Vietnam was in some aspects. I, I can remember I was probably flying up from the train to Da Nang. I was in a Huey looking out. We were flying out over the South China Sea just over the beach. Beautiful rice paddies, that tropical view, except it looked like a kid with acne with all the bomb craters. And then in the back time were four fast movers <laughs> doing bomb strikes <laughs> so that that beautiful south pacific vista palm trees <laughs> with a war going on right there at the same time so it was it was like watching a beautiful woman getting given getting sexually assaulted i i don't the the analogies could be endless i guess have you been back mike it sounds like you love the love the country I, I I would love to go back, but I've never been in a position to, uh, you know, at the reunions, I've met guys that moved back there that lived there half the time. Uh, I would give my left nut to go back there, but uh, it's never going to happen. I've got uh, one of the, uh, most of the sagas know him, Chris in Poland. He was a uh, reenactor, a sag reenactor. I've always wanted to visit him, you know, I was trying to look for an opportunity, trying to get a you know a military flight into Germany and going to Poland. <laughs> well, I, I think Mike, um, in closing, um, yes. I, I'd just like to say you know a, a big thank you from myself and Sam, um, yeah. and from the audience here uh, for sharing your stories with us and uh, you know um, uh, giving us a bit of an insight into the life you've led and uh, and the experiences you've had, and that's you know that's. It, we're all younger we haven't had anything like those experiences you know so so hearing it from you and hearing the way that you've you know reacted to it what you've adapted to and it, you know there's there's a lot we can all learn from it so it's not it's not just listening to a story it actually changes the audience who who hears the story so so you know really seriously thank you for, for sharing it with us incredible uh, life real, perspective a huge pleasure to spend time and just get to know you a little bit and i'm really looking forward to showing you our game and uh, and seeing what you think of it.